practice in entrepreneurs have a PhD. So without ado, but let me just say before um, we move on to the participants, um, I as moderator will be monitoring when we get to the session on question and answers. So if you do not have your um, agenda with you this morning, let me just, and also officer in charge, um, I, my role this morning is to welcome you and to make the opening remarks. So let me give you a good morning and to welcome you to our panelists, as well as to all of the participants who have joined us from the rest of the OECS member states and wider Caribbean and internationally. Um, I hope everyone has been and remains safe and are taking all the precautions to do so. Um, we are living in very unprecedented times with COVID-19. Um, this is not something any of us had imagined just four months ago. Um, life has changed, the way we work has changed. Um, and I think even though COVID-19 will um, be a past um, sometime in the future, I am not sure that we will um, return exactly to life as it was before. So that's why we have now what is called the new normal. Um, just as I said, we crazy. Uh, Anya, could you check on WG's link? He's having problems. Um, so as I said, my role is to welcome you this morning to this kickoff meeting. Um, but before I do, allow me just to thank God for his mercies and his goodness and to pray for his guidance and his wisdom um, today as we deliberate and discuss important matters related to the economic growth and development of the OECS. Um, this virtual kickoff meeting, as I said, is to launch a project. I am not going to get into the details of the project because over the next 20 minutes or so, we are going to be receiving some remarks from um, the heads and leaders of the OECS Commission, as well as Conflict Caribbean Partnership Facility, followed by a series of presentations on the project. Suffice to say that entrepreneurship is a very important element um, for economic development. It's one of the key factors of production in addition to land, um, capital, and labor. So the role of entrepreneurs in taking risks in um, innovative and coming up ideas for business is quite important. And even now in post-COVID or in COVID-19, finding new ways and new opportunities um, to adjust and to readjust to the circumstances that we are now facing. Entrepreneurs have a PEO. So without ado, but let me just say before um, we move on to the participants, um, I as moderator will be monitoring when we get to the session on question and answers. So if you do not have your um, agenda with you this morning, let me just set it out. So we will have the opening ceremony. Um, for next will be remarks from Dr. from Mrs. Jacqueline Emanuel Fleur, Director General, Director, sorry, of the Economic Affairs and Economic Integration Division, followed by hopefully the remarks from the Director General, Dr. Didika Strews. Um, then finally, remarks from Dr. Sylvia Donhurt. Um, the private sector lead specialist of the IADB and executive director of Conflict Caribbean. Then we will have a series of presentations, um, three of which, three of them, and then we will have a question and answer. During that question and answer session, you are able to ask questions. You are able to raise to um, indicate those questions in the chat, as well as um, possibly raising your hands. And I look at very, very, very verify that and that you could be allowed to talk and allowed to speak to ask those questions. Okay, so that way we will be able to have an orderly um, meeting. So let me just welcome Dr. Jules who has joined us this um, right now. And pass over now and invite Mrs. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, who is my, my boss and the Director of the Economic Affairs and Regional Integration Division to make a few remarks. Uh, Mrs. Flood, the floor over to you. Good morning, um, distinguished panelists, and good morning, participants who have joined us today on what is, in my view, historic. We are doing it on the very unprecedented conditions virtually, but um, we are nevertheless really, really happy to be at this point of kicking off this business ecosystem enhancement project 
together with our partners from Compi Caribbean. So I want to recognize our distinguished um, Director General, Dr. Didicus Jules, and um, Dr. Um, Sylvia Donat, if I got that right, who is the, the head of the Compi Caribbean, who has been alongside with us on this journey, the technical specialists from both Compi Caribbean and the CBU, the Competitive Business Unit, who have joined us today for this occasion. Um, I want to thank you. I will be giving you, I perhaps, Entrepreneurship 101, because I have a panel of experts who are going to be following behind me. So I want to keep it simple, but I really want to give you a sense of how important this is to us um, at the OECS Commission and what our goal is, and basically give you a good scope of what, this, what we are about here and what this project will do. Um, the OECS Competitive Business Unit is engaged continuously with the business support organizations throughout our member states in the pursuit of accelerating growth and development. Um, fostering entrepreneurship at the national and regional level is vital in this pursuit. The Director General has made it one of his priorities, at least from my tenure in the OECS Commission, to exactly fully embrace entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship development in all its facets. The goal is to spark creativity, to um, idea generation, to see new business bo um, born, investment increase, to create, to optimize opportunities, to develop really modern winning, success winning models to help businesses grow within their national space, within the OECS single economy and internationally. I recall um, my director general and myself visiting the Compi Caribbean offices in Barbados not long ago, when Sylvia and her team graciously met with us and agreed to work with us. And today we are here because this is fruit that is being born from that seed that was planted right then. So before I go any further about this, I really want to go on the record of thanking Compi Caribbean for working with the OECS Commission through the CBU to bring us to this point today where we are really right now launching a service that will, for business entrepreneurs in the region to, to help them grow. From my, in my simple definition of entrepreneurship, I see it as the interlocking of enterprise risk and innovation to create added value. It has been fueled by research and the pursuit of efficiency. This happens at the, in the private sector at the lowest level when one person gets a brilliant idea that he wants to develop to provide a service or a good to the rest of us in the society and to the world. I think the COVID-19 situation has demonstrated very, very clearly that we are living in a global village. We face the same problems at the same time, whether it be health crises or environmental crises. So it is not far-fetched for a, a single individual in an OECS country to have an idea that can impact the world. That's what we had to see happen. That's where we had to nurture. And this project is going to help us to do so. Our intervention is based on real evidence, is really evidence-based. Compete Caribbean came alongside and helped us to really do the research, to look at our environment, look at the, and to determine the characteristics of our entrepreneurs. I have said many times, and I believe it, that the OECS and any member country of the OECS have no lack of ideas. We have a lot of ideas, but the journey from, become, from an idea to validation to startup, and startup itself is a very perilous, perilous um, experience for new businesses to becoming success is a journey. And while the OECS is rife full of ideas, innovative ideas, very few, we are perhaps among the lowest in regions of the ratio of businesses that move successfully from ideas to become a global enterprise. And that's what we wanted to investigate and, the OI, and Compete Caribbean came alongside and did that work with us. I'm not going to touch it because I know that they are going to expand on it later in this presentation. But a couple of key things I want to point out we, that, were, that were highlighted. One, why OECS businesses have difficulty? What are the gaps and the challenges? The lack of growth and focus, people, people who can be focused on entrepreneurship. The lack of business advisory services that support growth throughout the life cycle of the business. Limited support 
for innovative entrepreneurship, though entrepreneurs, those who have really innovative ideas that require research and testing and so on, they do not necessarily have the right support to help them validate their ideas and develop them. Um, the lack of the white say weak MSME policies and legislative frameworks. And of course, most people will agree with me, lack of access to finance. These were some of the highlights that came out of this research um, exercise. But what do they need? They need, when you bring it all, we string it all together, entrepreneurs need a supportive environment. Now, I want to say entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs because I want us to think broadly. The OECS, we know that we have a high rate of youth unemployment, and we definitely want to go out there and to get our youth on board. But entrepreneurship spans beyond that. In defense of the gray hairs on the panel and those who are at least in the audience, it's anybody can be an entrepreneur. And we want to, be, to cast the net wide to be able to embrace anyone who wants to develop their ideas and take it into, bring it into fruition. Um, with the Complete Caribbean's input, we recognize that what we need to focus on is the entrepreneurship ecosystem, a system that stimulates entrepreneurship, a system that supports entrepreneurship, and a system that can sustain entrepreneurship. Therefore, it needs to be inspiring and inclusive to basically be, be able to excite people to get into business, to become risk takers. It needs to be engendering the entrepreneurship spirit. It needs to be a work that is responsive and it must, therefore, it must be entrepreneur-centric. We must be able to provide services that are centered, that are created and designed to respond to the needs of entrepreneurs. And thirdly, it is to be dyna dynamic. That means it must support entrepreneurs throughout the business life cycle. But it's one thing to become successful, but it's another thing to remain successful. This, this project that we are doing today addresses those things. We've been able together to put a project together that addresses acceleration, helping business, accelerating people to move their business forward, bringing digest to, to, the, to, to the fore. It addresses incubation, providing an environment that can bring all the key supports to businesses. And of course, it addresses some of the, the financial challenges. How do we meet the financial challenges? And we're going to look at some of the modern technologies to do that. I don't want to but take more than my 10 minutes, but I am sure by now you will agree with me that fundamentally entrepreneurship development is about capacity building. It's about growing the people of the OECS. And we will do so with the stakeholders. I have a product company, Caribbean, who have worked with us from taking this seed to where it is today, to fruition, and will continue to work with us to make it happen. But among the participants, we are, we are hoping that you are there. We'll be working with all the stakeholders, the business support organizations who have the footprint in the countries, the business people, the creative people, the seniors, the youth, the financial um, um, institutions. This project will create the network that bring all those partners to the table to create that business support ecosystem. I am really happy to be at the table today with my colleagues on behalf of the commission, and the CBU, the, Com the Competitive Business Unit is based in Dominica. We are here as a team to work with all the stakeholders to make this project a success. At the end of the day, we expect that we will be bringing close to 60 entrepreneurs for coming forward, being supported through acceleration and incubation. And we will be seeing some successful businesses who can span our Caribbean region and our world. I thank you. And I, I turn back to the moderator. Thank you, Ricardo, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Flood, for that very um, inspiring um, remarks. You really have set the tone and the context for our discussions this morning. So let me just thank you. Um, now, as I indicated, I'm going to switch the, um, the remarks um, so that I would allow Dr. Jules to have the last say in the remarks in our opening ceremony. So now I will turn to Dr. Sylvia Donhurt, who is a private sector lead specialist in, from the Inter-American Development Bank and the executive director of Compute Caribbean, who uh, is our partner today in this very important project. Dr. Donhurt, the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. 
Uh, and I want to echo uh, Jacqueline. First of all, I really want to welcome everybody uh, to this virtual launch. I'm so happy that we're able to do it despite the difficulties that we're all facing with our multiple lockdowns. And that we, you know, thank, thankfully, I mean, despite the, um, you know, the terrible consequences of the pandemic, we're living in a time where technology can, imagine if we had lived this pandemic in a time without this technology, we would be completely stopped. And now at least we can continue some of the work online and so on. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for all the effort that was put into this launch. I see that we have a great audience. Uh, well, I wanted to echo Jacqueline's words. Uh, I was so happy when you guys came to Barbados uh, to see what we could do together and to see, you know, the enthusiasm and the leadership uh, that the OECS Secretariat um, wanted to have on these issues of how to rekindle growth in the Eastern Caribbean. My, my, I want to give a, a little presentation. It's very short, Ricardo. I promise I won't take more than 10 minutes, okay? But I just want to set the context about why we're interested, so interested in ecosystems of entrepreneurship in the Caribbean and particularly in the OECS, okay? And it has a little bit of a diagnostic of what we see happening in the Caribbean overall and why this is important. And given that I've seen that you, there's, there are lots of influencers in the audience, I didn't want to lose a chance to transmit this message. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, tell me when you see it. Yeah, you're seeing it now? Yes, yes we we're can. seeing it. Okay, are you seeing it in, in presentation format? Let me put it. No, in not yet. Okay. okay, so uh, first of all, I wanted to like really give a plug to our donors because Compi Caribbean is a private sector development technical assistance program that's financed through the generosity of the Inter-American Development Bank, the United Kingdom's Department for International Development, the Caribbean Development Bank, and the Government of Canada. No? So they're as important here as we are, and I didn't want to uh, uh, leave that um, uh, down. No? So why, you know, why is there at all a program like ours, a private sector development program in the Caribbean? And it really comes from a diagnostic of seeing that, you know, when you compare the Caribbean with the rest of small economies in the world, these are economies that have less than 3 million people in population. Uh, you find that while in the 1970s, the Caribbean had almost four times the GDP per capita of these other economies. By 2014, it, it had the rest of, of, of small economies had overtaken the Caribbean in GDP per capita, right? And the, the question was, you know, why had this happened? And uh, so economists at the IDB did a decomposition of GDP growth. And they found that uh, the main explanation for this uh, change in trajectory that the Caribbean had been having with, in relation to the rest of small economies was total factor productivity growth. So uh, total factor productivity growth, and there you can see the curves, right? So the red curve is, you know, compared to the rest of small economies. And if the Caribbean were doing the same, were growing at the same rate of the rest of small economies in total factor productivity growth, it would have that horizontal red line. So you can see that up to the 1990s, especially the Caribbean uh, tourism countries were growing a little faster in total factor productivity growth, and then it falls very dramatically. What is a total factor productivity growth and how does that um, mesh with this idea of ecosystems of entrepreneurship? Really, it's about a total factor productivity growth. It's about how an economy combines its factors of production, so capital and labor, to produce new value added, more higher value added pro products that can really help growth. And it's also sometimes used as an indicator of technological change because technology can also increase total factor productivity growth by allowing an economy to produce more with what it has, okay? Uh, so this slide, what it says is, you know, total factor productivity growth has been declining in the Caribbean, and what can we do about that? So the Compete Caribbean program was really born, uh, focused on private sector development in an attempt to explore this or explore mechanisms 
to increase total factor productivity growth. And it really works in two fronts. One and is how do you increase the productivity of firms? Because in the end, private sector firms are the motor of an economy, and they are the ones that are combining the factors of production, right? And the way that Compete Caribbean approaches it, and because of what has been found across the rest of the world, is how do you stimulate innovation in businesses in the Caribbean? Because that's what's really going to increase your total factor productivity growth. And, uh, and then on the other side comes the regulatory uh, environment that Jacqueline was speaking to. No? How do you make a regulatory environment that not only makes it easy for businesses to register, to open, to close, to invest in sectors that suddenly have great opportunities, take out resources from sectors that are stagnant, but how do you also uh, make a supportive environment for those businesses? because there are lots of market failure and it's not only about getting the legislation right. It's also about what institutions can you have that can support new ideas that are risky and that therefore perhaps nobody in the commercial um, markets, for example, will finance at the outset, right? So uh, just to tell you, okay, Compete Caribbean worked on those, these two fronts from 2011 to uh, beginning of 2017. We promoted directly a lot of innovation in businesses, most of them were startups, and also throughout clusters, as well as business climate reforms. And we were quite successful in the you know, headline results that were important to the program and to its donors. So uh, the program ended up uh, uh, helping to create 12,000 new jobs. Half of them came from these private sector instruments, half of them came from support that we gave to institutions throughout the Caribbean uh, to support new sectors. In particular here, I want to credit the investment attraction uh, agencies. And, and in two countries in particular, we supported them in attracting business process outsourcing investors. And that was responsible for like half of the jobs. But the other half was on the businesses that we supported directly, okay? And those businesses that we supported directly which uh, uh, were more than uh, 500, they increased their revenues by 41% in comparison to their baseline, so by 153 million US dollars, or and their exports by 23%, so by 37 million dollars. So the program really paid its, or sorry, gave returns beyond what we had invested, which was 32.5 million dollars in total, okay? In this phase two, we have $22.5 million, although we're getting an injection of 4.5 million in ad additional to work specifically on the blue economy. And we have the same goals that we had had before, but now, uh, because we are a program that doesn't have a legal structure, right? We are a program that's executed by the IDB. We are now intent to transfer the methodologies that we used in the first phase and that we found to be, a, that worked to institutions um, in the region, such as the OECS Secretariat. So we have two, we continue to have two pillars. One pillar, we work on productivity and innovation in the private sector. And the other one, the second pillar is on business climate reforms. In both pillars, we're doing a lot of work in the Eastern Caribbean. But I want to focus on the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem instrument uh, within the pillar of productivity and innovation in the private sector. So the OECS, we're, we're helping to support ecosystems of innovation in the OECS, in Jamaica, in collaboration with the Development Bank of Jamaica, in Barbados, in collaboration with the Ministry of Small uh, Business, Entrepreneurship and Commerce, and a, a probably with a Ministry of Innovation um, and Smart Technology. Uh, we're um, doing something very novel, which is we're working with regional corporates and helping them partner with startups in something that's called corporate venturing, where uh, in these partnerships, they create a win-win um, relationship that can favor both the startup and the corporate. We're doing social innovation in Belize, and we're also working on public procurement for innovation. I won't go into each of these, it's just to mention what we're doing, right? Uh, and these are, this is my last slide, and just to say that entrepreneurship ecosystems are so important 
Uh, because we have seen in the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean that those countries that had very solid ecosystems of entrepreneurship and innovation, beyond being, you know, a motor for growth in this COVID situation, they were able to do things such as help entrepreneurs pivot business models, help entrepreneurs produce rapid test kits, ventilators, respirators, things that were really, really, really needed uh, for the COVID crisis. Some of which can become an opportunity for exports even uh, during this period and maybe retooled beyond the COVID pandemic, right? So, uh, in, in, so that's one point. But the other point is that the Caribbean, we've seen through our work that the Caribbean already has innovative firms that are going global, right? Or that have the potential to go global, but it does lack specialized supporting business development institutions that can support entrepreneurship and innovation. Most business support organizations in the Caribbean, they work really with um, um, small and medium enterprises in helping them, you know, with, um, with business models, business plans, and so on. But more is needed. It's a different category of firms and a different category of services to really support entrepreneurship and innovation. In Latin America, where, we, where these institutions exist, impact evaluations, which means looking at what happens in the businesses that are supported vis-a-vis -vis identical businesses that are not supported, have revealed that for every dollar that the public sector places on investing in these firms, there are 19 tax dollars generated in that country. This is specifically the case of Uruguay, which is a country of 3 million people. It seems, you know, bigger than the OECS region, but 3 million is a very small country. And these are the results that they, are, uh, they have produced. Uh, and, but we are super happy to see that the Caribbean is evolving and it's developing stronger ecosystems, including this project in the OECS. And with that, uh, just to restate that we are so happy about this project and I want to credit, you know, on, on behalf of the OECS Secretariat, all the team, uh, Jacqueline, Ricardo, Puesi, and on our behalf, of course, under the leadership of Dr. Jules, and on our, uh, on, on our side, the leadership of Kieran Swift and Annie Bertrand, under our specialist as well, Adrian Maguen. So thank you. And I will stop the share. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, if I may, for this presentation. I think you have taken, the, um, taken us further in setting the context, um, highlighting the imperative that we have for um, developing the ecosystem for entrepreneurship in the OECS, um, particularly, as you pointed out, the performance of the OECS vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the small economies um, in the world. I think um, that is something that certainly wakes us up to the need to, um, to, to advance um, our goals on entrepreneurship. Um, so thank you very much. Um, also, we have already done so through um, Chucky, um, but it has been a pleasure working with you and your team on this project, and we do look forward to um, continuing this endeavor um, in this project, but hopefully in others um, to come. So thank you very much. And now it is my pleasure to introduce and to invite Dr. Didika Schultz, the Director General of the OECS. Um, as um, Chucky mentioned, um, this area of entrepreneurship is particularly important to him and dear to his heart. He has articulated this as a priority for the OECS um, a number of times, and I'm sure he's going to do so again um, in his remarks. So Dr. Jules, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And um, I would like to associate myself with all of the expressions of deep appreciation to Car Compete Caribbean for the collaboration. Uh, Dr. Sylvia Donhut, Ms. Jackie Emmanuel Flood, Director, Economic Affairs, distinguished panelists and participants, colleagues of the commission, it's been said that <clears throat> change only happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. In other words, change requires an individual or a society to decide to adjust their habits or their behaviors, notwithstanding the uncertainty and the discomfort. 
in this 21st century, businesses that are able to innovate and to adjust to consumer demands through technology have been in fact the most successful. The success of these disruptors is in part due to a willingness to embrace change and the ability to reimagine the future. One thinks of disruptors like Jeff Bezos of Amazon, who incidentally is now a trillionaire thanks to COVID, Elon Musk of SpaceX and Tesla, and even in our own region, with our large ambitions, Johan and Dujon, all had to embrace change and reimagine the world of tomorrow. Sometimes change becomes transformative when enough people decide to abandon past practice and embrace new thinking. So it all starts with a mindset shift. The kickoff of this important project sends a clear signal that the OECS Commission is committed to fostering a business environment that promotes innovation and dynamism through technology. Indeed, my personal hope is that this project will seed a critical mass of business leaders in both legacy enterprises and startups that will revolutionize the business environment in the OECS. And there are several initiatives that we are undertaking within the OECS that speak to this. I must invite everyone to sign up for our Sustainable Development Movement 2020 that is being held in September 2020, which is preceded by a series of exciting webinars and virtual events. But this is going to be our focal point for synthesizing the work that we are doing to rapidly build this ecosystem with the assistance of world-class entrepreneurs and investors from within the OECS and the Caribbean diaspora. In fact, we also have with the World Bank a digital transformation uh, project that is going to, for approval to their board in the coming week that we expect will also be another piece of that puzzle to bring all of these initiatives in a syncretic whole. The author Malcolm Gladwell describes a tipping point as that magic moment when an idea, a trend or a behavior crosses a line tips and spreads like wildfire. 2020 marks a tipping point for the OECS. COVID-19 has forced our public sector to transition mm. from bureaucratic and traditional methods of service delivery to technology-based solutions. In a sense, 2020 is a critical inflection point for our region. The things that we spoke about for the last 20 years or more that we had not done during that period of time, we now have had to do within two or three weeks. For example, the fallout of the pandemic has led to a seismic shift to how healthcare and education are delivered across the OECS. We have had no choice but to embrace telemedicine and a new pedagogy that better responds to the learning needs of the youth. And again, I want to invite participants to log on or follow us on our website to see what we're doing. There's gonna be some really exciting and transformational things being done in education, not just by the commission, but by virtual teams involving the best expertise in member states working alongside our colleagues at the commission to completely revolutionize education. Client facing government services have also had to adopt technology based solutions. The pandemic has also exposed the opportunity for fintech solutions to be used to assist vulnerable populations access social protection grants and solutions such as digital wallets can allow for frictionless transfers and address the needs of the unbanked populations in the OECS. In fact, the World Bank project that I referred to earlier is precise. One of its components is working with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to create a digital EC dollar that is meant to serve that purpose. In observing these rapid changes, it could be argued that it is a public sector that is now leading the charge where innovation and disruption is concerned. Businesses must also seek to innovate and explore new processes and relevant technologies in order to grow and to become globally competitive. With this in mind, the launch of this project is particularly timely as it will strengthen the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems in the OECS. 
The project will deliver technical support for incubation of high potential startups, acceleration of high growth and high potential small and medium enterprises, and will promote the adoption of fintech solutions by customers and firms across the OECS. According to PricewaterhouseCooper, the world economy could more than double in size by 2050 if technology-driven product improvements continue. Innovation-led economic growth has the potential to raise the living standards across the OECS. And again, you will be seeing us launch in the near future a 5,000 digital jobs initiative across the OECS that speaks to this. So let's be clear that this project is an acknowledgement that greater effort is needed to expand and improve the business environment in a manner that improves the lives of ordinary people. To make this happen, we must be bold and believe in ourselves. A strong innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem can allow OECS innovators to successfully compete with firms from across the globe. Given the natural creativity and aptitude of our youth, it is likely that efforts aimed at incubating startups and accelerating growth of indigenous small businesses could lead to the creation of a global market leading firm. I cannot overemphasize that we have proven time and time again to have the raw talent and creativity required to be world beaters in innovation. But to ensure the sustainability and the success of this program, it is critical that synergies be established with training institutions, such as our technical and vocational colleges to promote digital literacy. And again, what we are doing here, although we are working on this within the ambit of the Division of Economic Affairs and Regional Integration, it cross cuts across to the work we are doing in education because we do have a council on higher education that includes the principals of all of the technical and community colleges in the OECS. So this work is going to be transposed into that uh, sector. Further, during the inception phase of the project, um, the conversations should be held, will be held with the World Bank funded digital transformation project that I described earlier, as well as the ECCB on its digital currency pilot program. The work already undertaken through these groundbreaking initiatives can provide crucial insights into the key risk factors, as well as the unexplored opportunities. On a more fundamental level, this project will support digital transformation positively impacting the way people live, learn, and work. Digital transformation has immense potential to enhance the relationships between government, businesses, and their clients. More precisely, it can positively impact the access and the delivery of healthcare, of education, of social services, and other public and consumer goods. New global realities demand that we adjust and we adapt and the project sends a strong signal of our commitment to seeding the change that will unlock the potential of our youth. So I want to thank all of you for logging into this uh, webinar, this launch, and uh, we certainly look forward with great anticipation to our deepened collaboration with Compete Caribbean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jules, um, for, for, this, for those remarks. I think you um, established the links um, with, of this project to the other initiatives that are taking place at the OECS, um, and again, broaden and set the context for our discussions today. So thank you very much. Um, so participants and panelists, we have come to the end of the opening session. Um, I would also encourage the participants to begin to type in your questions and your comments in the chat. We have already started to receive. Um, and when we get to the session on question and answers, we hope that you will be there so that we can read out your questions or give you the floor so that you can ask um, the panelists um, after we have received the presentations from them. So let me thank all the panelists for their remarks um, this morning and for setting the stage. We are now moving to the next phase, 
of this kickoff meeting, where we are going to give you some background and context um, to the work on entrepreneurship development in the OECS. Um, and I will start, this starts with my colleague, Mr. Tracy Roberts, who is a technical specialist um, for entrepreneurship and innovation at the OECS Competitive Business Unit. Um, Tracy, um, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Ricardo. I'm um, sorry, I was just trying to find my in, um, mic um, on mute there. Um, so yes, thank you very much, Ricardo. And um, thank you to the panelists who have gone before um, in terms of um, sharing that perspective on entrepreneurship and eco the ecosystem development within the member states. Um, so what I would essentially do in this presentation is basically just to outline um, what are some of the activities being undertaken within the member states and what are some of the challenges facing entrepreneurs as far as um, entrepreneurship is concerned from a technical perspective. And I, I, I must say that I'm certainly heartened and very appreciative of the um, comments uh, previously by Jack. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood and Dr. Jules and also um, by, by Dr. Sylvia Dunhart on um, this whole aspect of entrepreneurship development within the OECS. Um, so I would just take you through um, the context of the ecosystem and where we are at now. So as far as the ecosystem is concerned, and I hope that you are, sh are seeing my slides, but essentially as far as this ecosystem is concerned, we have a number of players within this ecosystem that are all focused on supporting startups and supporting firms toward development of business ideas and scaling of business ideas. Um, so we have um, at the governmental level, at the national level, we have um, national BSOs and lead agencies that are involved in this ecosystem development. We also have institutions like colleges and so on that are involved in some degree to, um, in the area of research and development, but are also involved in supporting young entrepreneurs in terms of developing their business ideas as well. Um, we also have within that ecosystem to consider, and this is based on the, the Aspen um, toolkit for entrepreneurship development, where we identify what are the key ingredients to developing a thriving ecosystem. And we look at infrastructure as one of those things where we have broad, broadband telecoms, for example, um, um, electricity, um, access, and so forth as one of the key factors. We also have, in terms of the private sector, we have work being done where the chambers of industries are concerned, for example, in developing entrepreneur entrepreneurship programs and supporting mentorship and um, providing support to entrepreneurs. But you also have um, business development programs and support programs that focus on some degree of um, in innovation, um, some degree of eco um, acceleration and so forth within the ecosystem. We also have a key ingredient, which is equity um, financing, um, and there's a discussion on that uh, I would get into a bit later, but finance is, access to finance is a very important part of that. But all of that at the end of the day, basically, as I think my colleagues indicated before, basically comes together to really ensure that we have that supportive infrastructure and mechanism for business development within the OECS. Um, before getting into those specifics though, I wanted to define a bit um, what the context is in terms of what we are speaking of. And I would say, based on um, the research that we have been doing, as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, we wanted to really clearly find that we are looking at um, entrepreneurship in the context of entrepreneurs or businesses that are in pursuit of opportunity beyond resources control. And, and that's borrowed from the 
Howard um, Stevenson definition um, from Harvard in terms of their definition of entrepreneurship. So that certainly looks at what entrepreneurs are to, necess are, are to be focused at essentially. In terms of startups, we are also focused on looking at, um, I think what we have considered is the OCD, OECD definition as far as startups are, con are concerned and looking at firms that um, include the majority of small businesses, um, maybe venture back firms that have that fast growth potential. But I wanted to go a step further and to say that as far as high growth enterprises are concerned. And when we consider Eurosat, um, the OECD Eurosat monitor for demographics in terms of statistics where entrepreneurs are concerned, we are looking at entrepreneurs that have that um, annualized revenue in excess of 20% um, and have also employees uh, in excess of more than 10. So, um, it's just setting the context for what we consider as high growth potential entrepreneurs, basically. Um, that being said, we have to give consideration to innovation. And I know my, um, my director, um, Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, indicated earlier some of the challenges we have in terms of innovation. And if we, pull, if we consider the, the data that is available where um, the... WIPO is concerned, World Intellectual Property Organization, we'll see that essentially we don't have many entrepreneurs within many patents, for example, being filed within the OECS. And patents are consideration as to the level of innovation and what is taking place in terms of innovation within the OECS ecosystem. Um, we do have some trademarks also being filed, but if we consider utility versus, for example, actual um, versus um, design patterns, for example, um, we'll see that essentially we don't have a lot coming from the OECS. So I think, I mean, essentially size is a, is, is a constraint or issue in that regard. Nevertheless, it speaks to the fact that we need to be more innovative. But if we also juxtapose that against the whole factor of considering entrepreneurs that are um, other markets like Asia, for example, we'll see based on what WIPO presents to us, what they are suggesting is that within the, the, the global context, there has been uh, an increase in this over 2008 to 2018 in terms of the number of patterns being filed, the number of um, and really is indicative of the number of innovative businesses basically coming to market with ideas that they would like to pattern. So I wanted to speak as well to the challenges and I know um, my colleagues before did hint at these challenges and some of the issues that are being faced with SMEs within the ecos ecosystem. One of the major issues is um, that whole issue of access to finance um, that is a major issue. Um, within the, the EC, ECCU, we have that challenge where, um, where deal flow is concerned in that we don't have that volume as far as the number of firms that are really, you know, uh, able to monetize or to, to take their business propositions to market. And um, we also have the challenge in terms of what type of financing is involved. In the slide I had up before, I did indicate that debt or equity financing is basically our options. Now, as far as equity financing are concern, is concerned, our major challenge is really in the limitations in terms of what is available for equity financing. So in other markets, let's say Jamaica, for example, there, um, there are numerous equity financing op options available However, within the OECS now, we are currently constrained in terms of the number of equity financing op options available. And that really also, you know, gets to the heart of the issue of deal flow in terms of our entrepreneurs and how ready they are to really access um, these financing options, financing options that are available. 
but also the issue of smart capital and whether our firms are in a capacity to you know, really take advantage of those opportunities and whether the financing available is actually you know, smart financing for early stage investors, um, early stage entrepreneurs, that it is smart, it is supportive, there is that element of mentorship and support available. So in other jurisdictions, yes, that is well developed. However, in the OECS, that is something that we are working on. Now, going to the whole issue of um, innovation ecosystems, no, that is a challenge that I spoke to earlier as far as the research and development is concerned. We do have a number of um, SME, well, we do have a number of institutions that are there, um, University of the West Indies, institutions that are supporting entrepreneurs. However, um, we do not have that high degree of innovation really moving to market. If we consider, for example, um, I think Jamaica, they may have uh, in excess of 100 entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial ideas being, being um, brought towards a, a system where they can you know, um, monetize these or patent these. We do not have that kind of system within the OECS. So that's one of the challenges we have to overcome in terms of ideation and development of ideas. Um, in terms of, well, high cost of energy, I think that's pretty much well known, but I wanted to also address the issue of disruption, which is a issue that affects us currently. And it's an issue that I think, well, it's going to be with us for quite a while. Um, and we have natural disasters. We have events like um, COVID-19. I just want to speak to that briefly. Those who have been on this call before may have seen this graph. But just to say that essentially COVID-19 um, and similar occurrences does affect our startups significantly because they are at a stage where they are burning through cash flow. But essentially, if they are to move to the next level, um, they may not necessarily have adequate cash flows to be able to, you know, to, to grow their businesses coming out of disasters like this. So we have to consider this. This is very important. Um, I just wanted to offer some thoughts on the um, policy framework as well. In terms of that policy framework, we have to consider um, within the OECS, so within our six protocol member states, we do have SME policies. The challenge um, is I think none of the policies really reflect or speak to innovation specifically per se, but they do clarify and identify what sort of SMEs we would look to, um, you know, in terms of development. Um, and so the classification really speaks to um, number of employees, turnover, percentage of ownership, nationality, and so forth. So there is a framework in place. Um, going to now the, the general policy framework, and I won't really go into this too much detail, but in too much de detail, but I would say, uh, as well that what is very important for us is that we consider within the treaty that we operate as the OECS Commission that that protocol exists that identifies sectors for support within the OECS as far as the revised treaty of Basseterre is concerned. So that's very important for us as well. Um, in terms of goals and so, um, as, as a CBU unit, we are committed to supporting the development of entrepreneurship and supporting development of firms that want to scale. We are supporting and providing support in the area of enhanced competitiveness and development to SMEs. Um, we want to foster in innovation and provide support to, the, to OECS MSMEs to penetrate markets as well, um, and also to build capacity of OECS trade and business support organizations because they are leading on this initiative. And I know many of you are on, are on this call, so you would certainly, um, you know, relate to this issue. In terms of the increased access to market intelligence, and so that's an area that also we see as very important as well to the scalability and growth of our entrepreneurs. We have some strategic priorities and it's really in terms of advancing and accelerating regional and economic integration. 
um, and mainstreaming, mainstreaming climate and economic and environmental resilience. That's very important um, in terms of the aspect of resilience, and I'll probably just touch on that a bit later. But just to say that these are all aligned with the sustainable development goals, which really fall under goal eight and nine in terms of promoting sustained and inclusive economic development and growth, um, and also building resilience as well. Um, in terms of the sectors being identified, so I mean, there are, there are a number of sectors we work with currently, but what we have seen in terms of the work that we have been doing as high priori priority um, in terms of the blue economy, for example, is an opportunity for serious growth and development. Um, I, I will identify this later, but I would like to say as well that this aspect or this focus is very important um, in terms of the work being done, for example, by our Geneva Mission and led by our Economic Affairs Division um, with Ms. Emmanuel Florence. But this is very important as well. Um, tourism is an, another important sector that we have identified and um, creative industries in terms of um, film and animation, but sort, sort of related to technology. Uh, without going into that um, um, in detail, I would just now move to the initiatives that we have been focused on in terms of the past years, 2018 to 2019, to speak a little bit about, I mean, we have worked with the Caribbean Innovation, um, Climate Innovation Fund to undertake a boot camp and in collaboration with the Chamber of Industry, so, sorry, the Coalition of Services in St. Lucia to host a, a boot camp for women entrepreneurs. We have also worked with the Martinique Chamber of Ind Industry and Commerce to basically run an entrepreneurship program. We have worked with entrepreneurs nationally and their BSOs to be able to launch a program that, or a supporter program that provides access to global accelerator programs for entrepreneurs in, in the Creative Business Cup. So we have been working in that, um, in that sphere and that arena. And we have also been engaged, as you would have heard earlier, with Compete Caribbean in terms of identifying some of the programs that can be done um, in support of the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So initially beginning with an ecosystem diagnostic. Um, in terms of general CBU activities, well, well, these are outlined here. Um, it's business support, it's ad advisory, um, cluster support, um, information provision, and so forth. So, so these are some of the areas that we currently focus on in terms of supporting entrepreneurs, training, as well as capacity building, right? Um, no, I wanted to just zero in a bit, um, and I'll finish shortly, just zero in a bit on some of the support instruments or support mechanisms that are, are being implemented by national business service organizations whom we work with, but they are currently undertaking a number of these programs. And we would see from the chart that I have up currently that there are several national entrepreneurship initiatives undertaken by lead institutions. So we would have pitch events, we would have business skills training, we'd have technical assistance. So, so, th so those are some of the inst um, activities being undertaken by um, lead agencies within the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Bearing in mind, I mean, it doesn't necessarily reflect all of the programs being undertaken because there are quite a few programs being undertaken. But as far as startups are concerned and energizing and fostering startups, these are some of the programs that we are actually, we have identified as being you know, implemented by member states. Now, in terms of these programs, what do they really yield? When you look at member states in terms of the impact, so we would have an annual basis. We'd have at, at least 100, uh, 100 SMEs or businesses registered um, on average so to speak, we'd have about 50% of the startups really getting point, getting past the three-point mark. That's important because that's one of the considerations in terms of what we look at as far as the, the, tool, the tool kit or framework for entrepreneurship success in terms of 
affirm being being able to get past that three three year mark in terms of their their uh, scalability as as concerned. Now, I would just look at a little bit in more detail, perhaps. Um, we look at what's happening as far as the lead startup agencies are concerned. Now, I identified member states in this chart, but essentially we do not have all of the data yet, but I would say that what we have so far sort of indicates to us what is happening in terms of that startup ecosystem and where the trends are over the past uh, six years or so. So it basically gives us um, an indication of what, what firms are, what startup agencies are doing and what are the results are essentially over that six year period. So um, I would, we would eventually fill in the data gaps, but um, just to say that this is, is important to consider because there is the intended result is really to scale um, and increase the number of startups within the ecosystem. Um, and if I just went to a country level in terms of the activities being done, if we consider that, I mean, we would see that there are a number of activities being undertaken by national business service organizations. I mean, the largest activity really is workshops. But what we want to focus on per se is the number of um, the area in terms of the informal sort of connections and so that establish that can be established with BSOs and with agencies within the ecosystem. So we notice that not a lot, not a lot of that is happening, but of course it, it I mean, it would certainly require um, funding as a case maybe for things like meet and greets, et cetera. But as it stands now, um, workshops are really sort of the focus of the, the, the BSOs. I remember that national agencies like um, Invest in Lucia, even um, CD in, in, in St. Vincent, have been working in terms of developing uh, programs to have established entrepreneurs meet with new entrepreneurs and sort of share their, you know, their perspectives and their ideas and so So we want to have more of that increase more of that within the ecosystem. And speaking to that collaboration really, um, and the supporting programs, I, I just outlined really some of these supporting programs based on responses from national lead institutions who are involved within the startup ecosystem. Now, you would find that commercial banks are providing loans as a case, maybe um, there's government fiscal incentives. Um, but the question, I guess, at the end of the day, essentially is how do firms draw down and benefit from these opportunities that have been provided? I know the government of, of St. Vincent, for example, has provided the, the prime program, which is an opportunity for entrepreneurs who are considering startups to really access that funding mechanism. So these are things that we want to help um, in terms of the connection, as the case may be. My colleagues who will come later will speak more to the specific findings of the ecosystem diagnostic that we did in 2019. But I'm just speaking in terms of our interaction with national business service organizations that lead that entrepreneurship focus within the, the member states. Um, we, we also looked to, at what is happening in terms of youth, uh, women, as the case may be, and we saw that there were many programs um, dedicated to youth, but not necessarily dedicated to other demographics within the ecosystem. Um, differently abled women, as the case may be, uh, or men, as the case may be. So um, that's something we, we have to consider in terms of as we bring our, bring our partners on board, what um, sort of solutions do we provide to address the demographic gap in terms of the programs? Um, initiatives that are being under, undertaken by startup agencies. So there's a list. I mean, the, significantly we notice that business skills training is, is a significant program that's currently being undertaken by national agencies. 
um, and the, the whole aspect of business plan development and technical assistance are also very important and those are being considered by member states currently in terms of those lead agencies that are implementing those programs. Um, and there's many tools that are being used. I mean, there's a business cam canvas model, there, there's all the whole aspect of financial templates, business plan templates, which is not clearly reflected here, but that actually is the highest, um, you know, the highest number in terms of what is the support program being provided to, or support tool being provided to um, business service organizations at, um, at this stage. Now, I just wanted to just leave you briefly with a consideration of what we are doing as far as members, um, as far as programs are concerned from the CBU perspective, OECS perspective, the, and also what is happening um, in terms of the synergies that are available for member states. So in the first instance, now I would identify that um, that 11th EDF program that we are currently working on. And really what we are seeking to do here is to deliver an e-learning platform and virtual marketing platform, which will be important to start up and existing entrepreneurs. But the synergies are really the establishment and building of a hub that all entrepreneurs can come to and say, this is an opportunity for entrepreneurs to access and to benefit from these programs um, that has sort of been channeled through the OECS Commission. Um, in terms of that pitch, and um, we are also doing that pitch competitions. As you know, we are doing the SDM pitch competitions, we are, which we are in the current year of the process of selecting entrepreneurs for that program, and also looking at a co coaching program with Caribbean Export, which they are supporting, and we, are, we really do appreciate their support in this regard, um, as far as coaching entrepreneurs to scale and develop their business models. So what we are looking at really is creating here a pipeline of entrepreneurs that have the opportunity to move beyond that startup stage and scale their business models. The, the blue black bio trade, I think I mentioned it earlier, but that's a very important um, aspect I would um, offer kudos as well to my colleagues because this is being led by um, our Geneva Mission, supported by UNTAD and um, Economic Affairs Development Division, and really looks at what are the opportunities in this value chain for developing innovative um, marine-based businesses that can exploit opportunities within that marine ecosystem and identify and identification and support of innovation, innovative enterprises within that, that um, space. Um, the, also, I would speak about the in, in institutional um, support program. We are seeking to support nationally across the region, business support organizations that are involved in, in that startup ecosystem, but are, that are also involved in terms of the harnessing of um, the opportunities from startups or existing enterprises to be able to scale their operations um, within the global and wider economy, basically. Intellectual property, and I alluded to it earlier, a very important point um, to improve our utilization or access to entrepreneurs um, intellectual property support opportunities One in collaboration with WIPO um, and to really get to that point where we can have entrepreneurs accessing these opportunities to scale their business as well. Um, as far as improved business and environment, generally we are working in that area and that I think my colleagues would speak to in the project as far as increasing the access to digital financing, digital financing opportunities um, and fintech solutions for SMEs within the ecosystems. So with that being said, um, I would like to say thank you very much for joining and um, thank you for the opportunity to present.
Thank you very much, Chrissy, for this comprehensive presentation. Um, you have identified and provided the, um, the framework, the context, what has been done at the OECS level, the policy framework um, driven, um, drawn from our revised treaty of BAS there. Um, you set out some of the initiatives that are happening on the ground. You also gave um, some findings from the um, entrepreneurship survey that you have done, and I think it points to some of the gaps that exist um, in the sort of needs that entrepreneurs have. I think that was mentioned before. Um, we have BSOs that do um, provide a lot of support for business development, enterprise development, but for entrepreneurship development, there is a specific set of needs that um, um, entrepreneurs have. Um, as they seek to venture into new businesses, take risks um, to be innovative. And these are some of the things that we are seeking to address as we strengthen the ecosystem for entrepreneurship and innovation. So thank you for that. Um, we are running behind time, but um, I think we are still able to um, achieve our targets for this morning um, in the time that we have remaining. Um, so now I would turn over the floor to um, Ms. Annie Bertrand, who is a Productivity and Innovation um, Specialist from Compete Caribbean, um, who is going to take us through the findings of the ecosystem diagnostic study that was done um, for the OECS. Um, the OECS and the CBU had approached um, Compete Caribbean to work with us on um, strengthening the ecosystem. And it was agreed that as a first step, um, it is important to know the situation, to understand um, where we are, um, to understand what the needs are, what the challenges are. So that um, diagnosis was done um, in the beginning of, um, at the end of 2018, um, and completed in the beginning of 2019. So, and the findings and the recommendations uh, what leads us to this project and the technical cooperation and that we have with Compute Caribbean. So, Annie, the floor is over to you as you tell us um, what were the findings of that study. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Ricardo. I, I think you can see my screen by now. Yes, you can. Excellent. So, I, I'm not going to repeat what has been said before because I think that we received a great background on the context so far. So, I'm just going to briefly talk about um, I mean, just clarify what we're talking about when we're talking about the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem, especially, especially uh, for this perspective of Compete Caribbean. And then just highlight the key findings from the dynastic. And then my colleague here on will talk about the recommended approach. So the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem here, uh, Kwesi and others have talked about this. So I don't want to I just wanted to specify two messages that I would like you to remember. The first one is, if you look at the, uh, in the box of finance, uh, I added here financial services because in the context of the OECS and in the context of digital world, um, I think that most entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem mapping that has been done in developed countries, um, take for granted that financial services are provided to MSMEs. Like for example, I'm a Canadian. When I wanted to get a PayPal account, it took me a day and I had it and I was able to start, you know, renting my apartment, go sleep at my friend's house for a week and we could split the profit. Now in the Caribbean, if you wanted to do that, eh, finding, you know, it's not just calling your bank officer and getting information, going online and getting information the challenges of getting access to financial services are much greater in the Caribbean and as well. So I think it is important in the context of the Caribbean and in the context of digital world that we consider access to financial services as an important component of the uh, ecosystem. The other message that I wanted to mention is that although each component in the ecosystem is important, the most important is the interactions among them. And this is why we're so excited to work with the OECS Secretariat because the OECS Secretariat 
doesn't have to make sure that every component doesn't have to support an, every component, but can make a big difference in ensuring that the components on there are interacting with each other. And um, having access to financial resources from international donors that sometimes national countries cannot have access to. They can also make sure that this can happen uh, at the national and regional level. Now, in terms of the entrepreneurship uh, development process, entrepreneurship can, yes, sustainably increase wages and uh, employment and improve livelihoods among the most vulnerable, but only if it evol evolves past informal necessity-based ventures and transitions into opportunity-based activities that are focused on growth. Um, I think it is important to distinction between necessity-based entrepreneurs and opportunity-based. I think Kwesi talked about it a little bit, but a necessity-based entrepreneur is somebody that oftentimes is self-employed or may employ others, but you know, the businesses is, is essentially used to uh, as a livelihood for themselves and the few people around them, but not necessarily as a way to generate a large number of employees and grow over time. Now, the other thing is I wanted to distinguish in, the, in your mind the difference between incubator and accelerator. So incubator is more than um, 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 a co-working space. Oftentimes people think that incubation services involves co-working space. Co-working spaces are interesting and valuable because they enable people to share ideas when they have a problem. They can solve problems, they can ask opinions of others because oftentimes when you have a co-working space, you have different individuals with different skills and backgrounds, so then you can leverage each other. It can also help to increase focus because you're working outside of your home and also it gives access to secretariat support and sometimes high-speed internet, which you may not have access otherwise. So it's not that co-working space is not good, it's, it is good, but it's insufficient. Uh, an incubator program um, will focus on uh, helping to refine your product services, but most importantly, to develop a business, a business model. So let me just give you an example. Concrete example, recently we had a youngster, like a young professional, young person who had a, an amazing business uh, idea to uh, essentially organize, sell an app that will enable young people and their parents to know when the football games were happening. And so, you know, user design centric and, you know, using the technology that exists and making sure that the design corresponds and it's user friendly he had interacted with the target market several times. He had done his homework. He knew exactly what the target market wanted to get, if they wanted to get the scores, this is how the app was designed. So it was, it was technically very sound and was uh, meeting the needs of this target market. However, when, you start, when they started to ask about willingness to pay, well, they realized that, yeah, it's true, it's important. And they were surprised to see that their willingness to pay was great. People were willing to pay for an app that would allow them to now plan their weekend in advance and start going to see matches and having fun. But the problem is that many of them did not have access to a credit card to download an app and pay for an app. So there are a lot of hurdles when you design a business model that you have to investigate, determine if you are going to have access to your customers and if, you, if your customers are going to be able to pay at the time that you need in order to pay for your, for your expenses. So therefore, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a proper incubator, the business, uh, the young businessman could have then investigate the possibility of instead of focusing on an app that really meets all the, the needs of the target market, but to see if maybe it, would, it could provide a functionality that would meet the needs of, of businesses that can pay. So for example, vendors, restaurants, that would maybe, if they knew that there was a large number of participants at a particular event, would then be willing to come and pay to know the information in advance. So that would be a, a, a different complete, a different set of different, different type of business model, but that would generate revenues for sustaining the business, but also um, generating increasing revenues for these businesses that would then certainly be able to have access to their target market. So, so this is just a, an example of incubator services that will help the entrepreneurs ask a bunch of questions and find solutions to those questions. And oftentimes, um, 
it, it is very difficult to find the, the, the answer. So for example, let's say the entrepreneur determines that, okay, to get this, the restaurant on site at a football match, they, you need a permission or a permit from different agencies in the government. It's very difficult for an entrepreneur to navigate all these different government agencies and get an answer when you need it. So an incubator can also help you to figure out where to go, who to talk to, and, and um, how to go about finding the, the answers. Um, so this is just to give you an example. Now, if we're thinking about the um, accelerator, on the other hand, it is, it, it, it is assumed that the products and services have been well developed and that the business model has been developed as well. But now it is about growing and scaling. So if, in the, if we take the same example uh, with the young lad who had an app to uh, sell, to offer an opportunity to understand where football matches were taking place. Uh, and if let's say, for example, that this business model was tested and the restaurants were super excited about it. It was a huge success. They had piloted in three locations and it was a huge success and the demand was growing. Well, as, as you're growing your demand, then it puts strength on your equipment, the technology, and also that you're at risk of being hacked. You need to invest in cybersecurity. You need to address some issues of access. So then you need to hire more coders. So the entrepreneurs now suddenly need a lot more support to help figure out how do you organize your operations, how you hire your staff, how you manage your, your team, how do you organize your governance structure, how do you, do you invest enough time on sales. Let's say, for example, this, this young lad had an opportunity to invest in a digital screen that would triple their revenues every month, then, well, you need to invest in that um, capital investment. So accelerator program will work with the entrepreneurs to help them figure out an investment proposal to attract investors, but also to help them give them advice and, and support to better understand how to manage and grow the business. Now, if we think about uh, moving now into innovation, innovation is a transformation of new ideas into economic and social solutions. So these are examples of innovation, but What's important to mention is that innovation is not the same as invention. So in the previous site, when we talk about incubators, oftentimes you have incubators that bring in inventors, inventors that have a great product and they're passionate about it. But oftentimes they need a business person to help them figure out how do you get your invention that in a way that it's, that it's, that there is the willingness to pay of your customers is aligned with the cost to sell it. Now, uh, in this particular case, innovation, where we generally focus on existing businesses that need to invest in new products or new processes or new practices or new structures. But business innovation is difficult, as you all know, because especially in the SMEs for SMEs, but not only SMEs, but when you Try when you need to evaluate the different innovation uh, opportunities for innovation, it is not easy. Obviously, the availability of information, and this is particularly true in the OECS, it is not that you can just quickly go online and then in a few hours you have your answers. Oftentimes, you have to call and follow up, make an appointment, and call again. And the information is not necessarily uh, easily available. And also, this issue of lack of convenience. So, if you know that there is a potential opportunity to innovate and you need to have access to certain things, it is not, when it is not convenient, it creates an additional barrier that oftentimes prevents you from moving forward. And of course, the absorption capacity. All the businesses are managed by human beings, and we, as human beings, oftentimes resist change because it's struggling, it's difficult to adopt. Uh, new technology and new way of doing things. And then obviously the final point is that when you invest in, innov in innovation, you are not always 100% sure that you will get a return on your investment. And also you do not know when you will get your return on investment. So it is oftentimes difficult to convince, convince investors and bankers to invest in your innovation, innovative idea because you're not 100% sure if this is going to be successful. So this is a market failure essentially, and this is why Compete Caribbean and the Competitiveness Technology and Innovation Unit of the IDB is trying to play a role to help support government um, and entities to address this market failure. 
Now, more specifically, the original assessment. So as I said, I'm not gonna repeat what has been said before. We analyze the ecosystem in the six OECS countries. And here are the key strengths that we have identified. I mean, there are several, but just to highlight a few points. We know that there are many businesses, or, uh, business support organizations, and we know that they care about women, youth, they are very inclusive. And uh, we know that there are several options that are available for entrepreneurs. We also know, as Kwesi explained in detail, there are several initiatives going on from regional and international support entities. Now, the third point is about the cluster initiatives. I think most of you know that uh, Compete Carbon has funded several cluster initiatives in the uh, OECS. One most recently has been the flowers, the flower cluster in Grenada. Uh, and the Coco in Dominica, Honey in St. Lucia, and there are two uh, potential, one, potential ones that will be funded in St. Lucia and in Dominica on tourism due to the recent call for cluster proposals focused on tourism. The reason I'm mentioning these cluster initiatives is that they play an important role in the ecosystem because a cluster an initiative, what it does is it address the coordination problems that oftentimes exist even in the small country coordination problems between different stakeholders within different entities and the private sectors at the, at the national level. It is very difficult to, to, to coordinate and leverage each other's support. So a cluster initiative will bring together at, uh, uh, at the same table, identify common goals, priorities, and address those um, ecosystem kind of approach. Now, finally, the cultural awareness of entrepreneurship and innovation in the OECS I, I mean, I'm telling you, even if you do not believe it, if you compare this, this uh, cultural awareness in the OECS to other places in the world, in the OECS, we clearly have a much stronger uh, um, uh, awareness of the value and importance of entrepreneurship and innovation. But this is very an important strain that we can build on. Now, in terms of weakness, we talked about lack of access to finance. I'm not going to mention it again, but I want to emphasize this issue of cash and paper-based economies. Look. 80 to 90% of transactions in the OECS are, are paper-based. So why is that today in 2020? I mean, there are several reasons why we are still stuck with cash and paper. The first reason, well, the first is that there is a lack of access to cost-effective financial services. So if you look at the table here, we see the six OECS countries. We have a lot of regional banks. And most regional banks, I would say, I mean, from, what I, from my understanding is that they already offer e-payment, like online payment gateways that allow a business to sell online. So if you have a digital, if let's say you do, you do you write articles and, and you sell your, your services online, or if you do e-commerce, you can go to your bank and have access to an online payment gateway. But the problem is that oftentimes the price that you would pay and the level of effort that you need to do in order to access to this online payment gateway is very difficult or is very high. So therefore, um, that's why it prevents a lot of the SMEs of, from having access. Well, there's another issue is that the price difference among the different banking institutions is very different. So in, from one institution, you may pay, let's say, for example, a wire transfer $5. But for another institution, you may pay $45. So, so the idea is that for SMEs, there is an opportunity to perhaps having access to some in some cases, but you really have to work hard to find that out because the, again, the lack of access to information. Now, another thing is that the, the indigenous banks in the OECS, many of them are not fully equipped to offer on the online payment gateway that would enable MSMEs to sell online. So that's also um, um, a weakness that prevented many of the MSMEs to start doing online payments or online uh, e-commerce. Uh, another issue is that the uh, difficulty of, um, no, so the second point, the low penetration of fintech and mobile wallet. Um, obviously, for a fintech company to penetrate the OECS market, you have to, to deal with different regulation in every country because this is regulated. The fintech companies are regulated differently in each country. So there's another, this is create another barrier to entry for fintech companies. And, um, and uh, so that's why we don't have as many in the OECS that we may have in other countries in the world. Um, the third point is about the difficulty of onboarding. So the, for the, for that, that is also another reason why it explains that we have low, a high degree of financial inclusion of exclusion in the Caribbean is because in order to, 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 
to join a bank. So if you know that another bank is offering better uh, services in terms of online payment gateway, in order for you to become um, a member of that other bank or to sign up to the other bank, the requirements for opening a bank account are so high in the, in the OECS and in the Caribbean in general, more than in other countries. Therefore, uh, the, um, the difficulty of having access is higher again. And of course, there's the lack of knowledge and resistance to change. Now, another point is the management capacity at the firm level appears very weak. And that perhaps explain why we have so many BSOs and business skills training, because it is rampant, the need for uh, management uh, capacity. And that also uh, explains why we have perhaps a fragmented ecosystem, because the need is so great, there, there, the supply is of, of business support services is high, so it makes a system that is a bit more fragmented and it's very difficult to, to implement at the regional level a, mini, a monitoring and evaluation system that enables management of performance. Um, and there's also, we said before, the other, um, the other aspect, so I'm not going to dwell into them. Finally, the last one uh, that I wanted to mention was the limited support for growth-oriented innovation innovative entrepreneurship. So, I mean, if you, if you go back to the slides that Kwesi presented, you could clearly say that there is, a, there, is a, there is a challenge in terms of helping entrepreneurs have opportunities, but also at different, life, at different point in the life cycle. So in, if you look at the mapping of the entrepreneurship and ecosystem we did, which is a public document, if you want to look at it, it looks at every country specifically and overall. But it, the type, the level of support services that is available at the majority level of, uh, of firms is very limited. And finally, the entrepreneurship education has not translated into many new businesses uh, being formed. So if you look at this indicator of new businesses, which is the number of uh, new business and density, the, new, the number of new businesses registrations per 1,000 people is not doing, is not going so well. So, Let's not be discouraged. Obviously, there are opportunities. And in every crisis, there are opportunities. So COVID has obviously created a huge increase in the demand for digital solutions. So an increase in demand for digital solutions from different stakeholders. So you have the consumers that uh, now suddenly are more perhaps willing to use digital payment solutions because they don't want to carry around cash. They don't want to they don't want to touch the cash. They don't want to touch the paper. And they would like to, uh, during social distancing, still being able to pay different people. You have the MSMEs that um, are also a, in greater need for booking engines because now with the requirements for social distancing, so oftentimes the, 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 the small businesses will need to book, manage their booking a lot more efficiently because they cannot tolerate a certain number of customers at the same time. And then you have the tourism businesses that obviously if we want to open up the borders in the long run to international visitors, we'll have a much, we'll need a much, a lot, uh, we will need technology to manage their, the visitors, um, the visitors access points. And then uh, if you look at the table on the right side, we also have demand from the government uh, because obviously the digital infrastructure requires a lot of um, of digital, uh, the digital solutions as well. So all this need for this, this digital support, digital solutions uh, provides an opportunity for entrepreneurs and businesses alike to start generating new types of revenue streams. Other opportunities, we're talking about the transition to digital payments. It is not yet there, but it is it is not yet fully there, but it is there, the possibility of doing it. So, for example, in recent years, large investment has been made into the ACH infrastructure, which is currently underutilized in the, in the OECS. That means that there's a lot more scope for electronic funds transfer. There's also the credit unions that are now, uh, especially in the OECS, now interested in uh, offering mobile wallet solutions, even though the OECS are not capable of joining the ACH per se, uh, they can still on their own start to an integrate FinTech solutions into their operations. And then as Dr. Jules explained before, the CXCD pilot, which is the digital currency issued by the Eastern uh, Caribbean Central Bank, you know that East central banks around the world have been ex uh, exploring the possibility of central bank digital currency, which is a digital representation of the actual dollar. So it's not that it's not about Bitcoin or anything 
like that. But it's really about the dollar. Instead of having it in paper, you have it in a digital format on your mobile phone, on your mobile wallet. So many central banks around the world have been uh, understand the value of moving into that direction, but very few has done it yet. And uh, two of the most innovative central banks in the world that have done it or that are progressing towards it are in the Caribbean. One is the ECCB and the other one is the Central Bank of Bahamas. The, this is going to be super exciting because the, the, um, this digital wallet that anybody will be able to just download will enable um, people that, you know, like for example, let's say a restaurant owner on Friday has to go somewhere else to to, 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 to do whatever business or social activity, then you know that person can transfer the payment to the staff uh, distantly just by doing peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Or you can also do business to consumers transaction as well as business to business. So it would really transform the way that micro and small businesses operate in the OECS and it can also enable the creation of new business model completely different that has never been thought through before. And that's why it's exciting. Now the OECS, uh, another opportunity is the OECS Commission is keen to strengthen the ecosystem. Um, the, even if we have all these opportunities, as I said before, sometimes there is resistance to change. And mm, in a, for example, in Jamaica, we had an amazing FinTech solution that was, uh, that was deployed uh, to help micro, the most vulnerable groups on, in society but they just refused to adopt the new technology simply because they were scared and uncomfortable with the change. So the OECS Secretariat has strong credibility in the Caribbean, in the Eastern Caribbean. So it can use its credibility to help transform, um, transform change, I mean, to change behavior and to influence different stakeholders. It can also, as mentioned before, facilitate interactions among the different stakeholders to address the key bottlenecks because obviously they are a lot. And then for um, the OAS, I think uh, most of you have heard about the, the Small Business Development Center program that has been funded and supported by the Organization of American States. They provide a way for uh, all the different business support organizations across the region to share data on their clients and also to uh, share knowledge and um, all kinds of, of information that enable the ecosystem to be strengthened. Um, later on. And then finally, and this is important because we should not forget, although tourism right now is kind of not really strong, uh, we should not forgot, forget that it can create the, the tourism sector. Uh, there is an on top opportunity because last year we actually did uh, finance a consumer research in the American market to determine the willingness to pay of visitors for community based tourism products and services for authentic experiences. And we, 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 I think most of you have heard or know that there is, this is the change in, in the interest of visitors. They no longer are just interested in the sun, sand and sea, but they all also want to experience different things and they want to buy authentic products from the local uh, place. Now, we knew that, but we didn't know if they were willing to pay for it and how much they were willing to pay for it. And we discovered in this consumer research, which was actually done by Euromonitor and published last year, that you know many people are not aware of community-based tourism, but a lot of them are interested. And most interestingly about the willingness to pay is that, for example, an authentic meal, uh, most of them were interested in it. Most of them were willing to pay 100 US dollars per head for an authentic meal. But the price currently pay for an authentic, uh, authentic meal in the Caribbean is ten dollars. So there's a huge on tap opportunity here. The only other issue is that international visitors need to, wants to pay digitally. So if we are moving into the digital realm, then we will be able to tap into those willingness to pay. Threats, and then I'll stop here after that. So in terms of threats, well, obviously COVID can prevent the region from opening the market to international visitors. There's also other issues related to the change in political administration and disasters. Those are threats that you're really familiar with. No need to talk about them. But I just wanted to mention the last one around the barriers to entry for FinTech and tech companies. This is something important because um, it is something that, again, the OECS Secretariat and, and some other stakeholders can, uh, something that can be done about it. For example, um, in Barbados, uh, you know, the commercial banks oftentimes do, are 
in some places are resisting the fintech penetration. So in the case of Barbados, I was giving the example of BIT. They have a, a mobile wallet that has been deployed, reaching hundreds of merchants and thousands of consumers. But they have the banks, none of the banks in Barbados are allowing this mobile wallet to be integrated with the bank account. Therefore, if you are getting money on your mobile wallet, you have to go to a merchant to get your cash. Uh, because you cannot just deposit automatically into your bank account. And that's a problem that is created by the commercial banks. But in Barbados, the context is different because the commercial banks are not indigenous. They are, they are binded by their uh, headquarters somewhere else. Where in the case on the, of the OECS, this issue is perhaps less important, but it is something that needs to be looked at. And obviously the OECS secretariat or anybody in the, in the uh, sorry, in the, in the OECS, you cannot tell a bank, you have to do this. You cannot put pressure on the bank because if you do, then they may leave the, the region, which is not what you want either. But what I think is important is that we can better understand what is their bottleneck? What is their constraint? What is it, or if there is something that we can do, to help them reduce their resistance to adopt and, and, and work with the fintech, um, the fintech companies. Because obviously the commercial banks are making a lot of money with these ACH transfers and these check processing and all these other more uh, paper-based transactions. So, they, But it's not just that issue. There may be others and we can figure that out and try to address those, those constraints. And then also I mentioned before the inconsistencies of regulations across the region prevent companies to reach economies of scale because if you are if you are a tech company, regardless if you are a fintech company or a reg tech company or a tech company in general, oftentimes you need to invest heavily into equipment, cybersecurity, and so on. And penetrating a new market in itself is a challenging effort because you have to, you know, invest in marketing, invest in equipment, invest in all kinds of things. So when you go into every single OECS country and you have to get a registration, a permit, and then you, are, you have a lot of uncertainty if you're gonna get it, it's very difficult to make the investment proposition uh, valuable. So what we want to do essentially is to attract these companies and try to solve the, um, the constraint that they may be facing. So at this point I will stop because um, my colleague Kiran will, will present our proposed plan of action which will essentially try in some ways to remove the barriers to entry, but also uh, help entrepreneurs leverage the market opportunities and also um, look at existing firms and businesses and help them develop more resilient business models. And as my executive director mentioned before, all we want to do in the end is to increase revenues for Caribbean businesses, increase employment, especially for uh, and including the, the vulnerable group and the businesses that are owned by women and um, increase exports and foreign exchange because we use inclusive and sustainable principles in, in everything that we do. So I will stop there and I will be available for questions and at the end. Back to you, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Annie, for that very comprehensive um, presentation. And you raised quite a number of very good points. And even while you were speaking, but um, while the previous presenters were speaking, we have been seeing some comments and questions in the chat um, with regard to the issue of um, regulatory framework and the time it takes to, to switch banks if you wanted to do so. Um, one comment with regards to um, fintech startups um, from Jody Budu is that um, um, with regards to the licensing, harmonization, recognition within the OECS, uh, whether if a, a fintech company or fintech startup um, registered and met the regulatory requirements in one member state and wish to set up shop in another member state, did he have to go through the same process and how long? I think that's an important point. Of course, in the OECS, we're trying to create and we are creating an economic union where there is to be harmonized um, regulatory frameworks, a single economic space, so that once you're operating in one member state, you are effectively operating in all member states and you can move um, um, seamlessly and establish seamlessly. So, those are things that uh, we are working on in the economic union, but I guess um, we can talk about that in the, um, in the question and answer session. There is also a question about um, the death of R&D and IT support initiatives, as well as little specialized finance. Again, those are some of the points and comments that have been made. 
Um, as I indicated in the chat, I invite um, participants to, if you have your questions, you can type it in the Q&A um, box um, tab. You can also um, raise your hands when we get to the question and answer, and we will be able to identify you and to unmute and allow you to ask your questions, of course, during that time to allow us um, many questions and answers in the time that we have. We would be encouraging you to keep your questions um, as concise as possible, um, but we do welcome you to, to, um, to begin putting your questions um, in the chat. Um, and in the, we are going to take note, of course, we are recording the session and we are going to be taking note of all the points and all the questions that are being made in the, in the, in the chats. So thank you very much, Annie, for that. Um, we, the next presenter um, is from Dr. Um, Kiron. Dr. Kiran Swift, who is a project development consultant for Complete Caribbean. And following from the, um, the findings of the ecosystem study and the recommendations um, that came from that, um, we um, developed in collaboration with Complete Caribbean a technical cooperation project. This is a project that we are launching. And Kiran is going to take us through that. Um, he will outline um, the, you know, what are the issues? We are challenged, what is the problem? What is the logic model, the resource chain? Uh, to give a sense of what it is we hope to, to accomplish um, with this project over the next two years. So, Karen, you have the floor. Thank you, Ricardo, and good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, just confirming you're hearing me, Ricardo? Yes, we can hear and see your screen as well. Okay. Great. So good morning, everyone. Um, as was indicated, my name is Kieran Swift, and it's my pleasure to be here this morning representing Complete Caribbean and presenting uh, the details of the technical cooperation project that we have designed and approved in collaboration with the OECS. Now, uh, recognizing that we are behind time, so I will attempt to, to streamline uh, my presentation, really just hit some of the very key areas to the defining the, the elements of this project. Um, before doing so, I just wanted to pick up on one theme, which is that words obviously are quite important, are quite a bit of emphasis has been placed thus far through the morning's proceedings in defining and specifying terms like innovation and entrepreneurship and ecosystems and how all of those things contribute overall to economic growth and the overall well-being of the OECS. I wanted to pick up briefly on a somewhat more mundane word, which is strengthening. And the reason for that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a word there, it's, it's in the present continuous tense, because it, it implies an ongoing effort. So while this project, as any other project, has a defined start and end, a defined scope, um, and a particular set of results that we will intend to achieve, which I'm going to speak to, um, I just wanted to, to reinforce from the outset and to manage expectations that this effort as it is a, a pilot, as it is something that is intended to be catalytic for the OECS, um, by necessity, it, it must be complemented by all of the other efforts, some of which, uh, many of which, um, uh, our colleague Kwesi would have presented earlier and Dr. Jules and so on have spoken to, mm -hmm. as well as others that we perhaps may not be as aware of, and certainly we'd want to, to hear more about them during the Q&A. So with that, let me just jump right in. In terms of this technical cooperation project, it attempts to uh, address two objectives. The first is increasing the availability of support services directly targeted to growth-oriented and potentially innovative firms in the OECS. Um, I'll unpack that a bit more later on. But secondly, uh, it's our objective to strengthen the capacity of the competitive business unit as an active contributor to innovative entrepreneurship in the region. I think the ground has been well laid of all the efforts that the CBU is already engaging in and given their, their um, role and their positioning as a regional entity, um, I think that uh, they, they stand to offer a significant amount of value by coordinating and by connecting the dots between the various national level efforts and between all the other donor supported efforts that uh, support the OECS as a region. Now this project um, consists of two sets of, of, of um, inputs in terms of uh, finances, some in cash and some in kind. So 600,000 are being provided um, by the Complete Caribbean Partnership Facility and uh, just over 105,000 being provided in kind by the OECS. 
the execution period for this project is 24 months and it should be noted at that time or that um, actually kicked off on the 30th of April when the, the agreement was signed between the bank, the IDB and the OECS. Now there are three components to this project. The first looks at a business incubation program. Um, the, the term hybrid in there because when this was designed pre-COVID, the intention was to, to approach a blend of both online and offline um, delivery of those incubation services targeted specifically at early stage entrepreneurs, those startups and so on that have been defined earlier, particularly focusing as well on women-owned entrepreneurs and spread across all six of the independent OECF member states, which are the beneficiaries for this project. Over time and with the realities of, of COVID and so on, um, as we are uh, challenging and trying to support businesses to, to adapt and to be resilient, we also, as a program, need to adapt and be resilient. So we are giving consideration to a fully online system, um, but that isn't something that we're going to determine unilaterally. We're going to determine it on the basis of the realities of the overall environment, but also critically the needs of firms, as I said, spread across those six member states. Um, we're going to be pursuing the execution of this component by procuring uh, a private, factor, private sector entity, a, so a private firm, either, you know, we're looking broadly both within the OECS, across the Caribbean, and even internationally. Uh, and that firm is going to have the responsibility for building capacity. We've heard quite a bit so far this morning of the importance of building capacity on mentoring um, those target firms, those early stage firms and startups helping them to validate the business ideas that they bring to the fore in as lean a manner as possible, mm -hmm. and then to scale those businesses. Some amount of seed funding um, will be provided to a selection of the firms that, that are selected and that are taken through the, the, the capacity building of this component. I just want to underscore as well that the emphasis for both for this component and really running as a thread throughout the entire um, technical cooperation is really a focus on digitization. It's a focus on economic rejuvenation of the OECS. So really a focus on growth, exports, and so on, and, and, and definitely a, a focus on resilience. I don't need to belabor the point that this is a region that is beset by all different sorts of challenges on a regular basis. Um, uh, natural, natural disaster challenges, uh, high costs of energy, and so on has been well laid out before. And we don't even need to speak about COVID because COVID has ensured that 2020 goes down in record books as one for the ages. So in terms of, I just wanted to underline that throughout all of these, these various components that I'm going to present and the discussion that we're going to have, that that core emphasis on digitization, on um, building firms and supporting the, the development of firms that are innovative, that adequately, um, integrate technology into the operations that adopt uh, modern and progressive management practices and that develop resilient business models. That is effectively what we are attempting to do. So the outputs, the expected outputs for this particular component would be 20 early stage entrepreneurs, 20 startups trained on validating the business models and some of them provided with um, seed funding grants. And the breakdown of the financing is as laid out there. Some amount will go to, to, to fees and some amount going towards uh, the grants to the entrepreneurs themselves. Then in terms of the second component, the acceleration program, um, as has been discussed, the focus here really is on, on existing businesses, businesses who have an operational track record, they're offering some product or service already in the market, um, but they, they have an interest in growth, again, particularly focusing as well on women-owned firms across all six independent OECS member states. And these firms also require uh, capacities, a different set of capacities, but capacities nonetheless, they also would benefit from uh, mentoring uh, and strengthening their, their positions within global value chain and strengthening their, their um, connections to other businesses uh, with the, the ultimate intention of increasing their sales, adding to, to the job, the provision of jobs, increasing their market share and so on. Some of these firms are also intended to receive grant funding. Um, there's a, a larger uh, complement of firms that we expect to be able to service um, through this component. Um, to that point, I would also just double back on something I said earlier, and it's going to be a consistent thread. I even saw it raised as a question in terms of to what extent does this, this program um, of uh, this, this technical cooperation project integrate with other national level and other, uh, let's say, for example, donor-driven programs. 
and I would offer it, it, it needs to integrate with those to, to a fairly high extent. Um, what this, where this project will, will, will land and where it will lie and where it will grow and really thrive is in close interaction with and exploring synergies with other initiatives that are already, that are already being pursued, many of which Gracie has presented and, and, and we can detail more of them during the Q&A. So the breakdown of funding here is that for 250K going towards fees, that figure isn't correct. Um, so I apologize there's an error on the slide there, but let's just say for now proportion going towards fees and some proportion going towards grants as well to be provided to those SMEs. Um, of note, the OECS's in-kind contribution kicks in significantly here for this component. And the third one, um, as, as Annie has laid the, the, the floor for so, so elegantly and eloquently, it's really aimed at increasing the access to and the uptake of digital financial services to support digital transformation of businesses. Now, um, as Annie has been present, has been pointing to and, and some of the other colleagues, we have over uh, the time of, of designing and developing this project, been continuing to, to monitor and to engage with a number of the other initiatives taking place in the, in the space as they pertain to digital financial services. So at present, there are a number of different ways that we are looking at that we can pursue to, to really um, have a catalytic, catalytic, catalytic mm -hmm. effect and to, um, to, to make a difference, a meaningful difference in the, the availability of digital financial services in the OECS for OECS um, firms and entrepreneurs. Um, some of them are laid out on the screen there. Uh, in terms of, I mean, questions were asked, for example, of the, the regulatory framework and different differentials in the regulatory framework across the different member states. So, for example, there is a different financial services regulatory agency or department in each of the, the member states. Um, so that that is a fact. How so? How can that uh, 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 fact? How can the, the fact of that existence be smoothened? How can the path be smoothened? For example for fintech uh, firms or for digital financial services firms to be able to, to more seamlessly enter into the, the unified um, Eastern Caribbean economic space. That is one angle that we, we look at it at. The issues of education and awareness building are also critical in this space, both for firms on the one hand, for banks and financial, situation, um, financial institutions, for the regulators, and ultimately for customers. Um, how, what can we perhaps do to, to inject uh, 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 funding into uh, entities that, that want to, to bring to, to the fore and bring to bear their new innovative fintech based or, or digital financial based businesses. The constraint here, of course, is the, the fact that we are working within this company with $100,000. So there is a, obviously a need to be selective. We intend to engage uh, vigorously over the, the coming weeks to really zero in on the point that would be um, most effective and would align with what with our capabilities as compete and that would leave a, a tangible and meaningful legacy for the additional work that would need to be done beyond this project to continue to improve and to strengthen the ecosystems. Now just a quick final note on component three that's been mentioned before but just to say that this component You are sort of slowing down in your Hello, panelists. Is it the same for everyone? I'm Kyron. Can you hear? I'm finding it very. I can't hear Kieran, but I can hear you very clearly. Okay, yes, so I find that Kieran was broken, um, breaking up. Okay, so I think he might have temporarily. No, he's still on. 
So while we wait for um, Kyron to, to rejoin, oh. so I'm seeing his, Kyron, can you hear us? Hi, hi folks, yeah, I'm back. It seems that I'm a piece of on my internet and stopped cooperating for a second. Are, are you hearing me and seeing me again? Yes, we can hear and see the screen again. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going to trail it off. Um, I covered, for example, uh, the, the main point I wanted to make as it relates to component three is that unlike components one and two, where we sort of really narrowed in on the activities to be undertaken for component three, for a lot of the reasons that have been expressed, for example, in the, in the chat, as well as um, the, the background Annie has set, there are a range of options that are on the table for us. So the key point there is that over the next coming um, weeks and months, we are, well, weeks really, to, you know, weeks, we are going to be zeroing in on the specific points of intervention that can be most impactful and that can leave a, 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 an important legacy for the additional support that will be required going forward beyond this project. So um, with that, let me just step quickly into the implementation arrangement. So firstly, this technical cooperation is one that we define as beneficially executed. So that is to say, it is executed by the OACS Commission, particularly um, the, the Competitive Business Unit um, with Ricardo as the officer in charge, with supervision by the IDB through the competitive, Competitiveness Technology and Innovation Division in coordination with uh, at Caribbean. Um, the right. project output from the uh, individual presented at the outset. Okay, Perrin, you are back now. You have just for a few seconds, I'm broken up. Okay. Uh, Ricardo, a suggestion. Um, if Tyron speaks more slowly, it may help with the bandwidth because what's happening is Case of speaking is kind of, I guess, aggravating the bandwidth constriction. Okay, thank you, DJ. Kyron? Sure, put that yes. out of um, I'm actually coming close to the end in any case. So, uh, to speak uh, about the execution structure, so day to day execution will be driven primarily by the CBU providing overall oversight um, with support from the IDB, both through uh, the, the overall team leader, but uh, and significantly and primarily through the Compete Caribbean staff. That execution includes things like procuring the firms that I spoke to uh, that we would need for components one and two, um, dealing with matters of disbursing, reporting, monitoring, and so on. I uh, just wanted to underscore the point as well that the CBU was directly involved in the preparatory research activity, which informed the development of this technical cooperation project. So, Couple points um, quickly on, you know, our focus and how we deal with with overall uh, execution of these projects, uh, and that is twofold. One, a, a really a, sort of a laser focus on results. Um, there is a results framework for this project, as there is one for overall in compete, and while we continue to, to to monitor an ongoing basis and to be flexible. We do so with an aim of achieving the desired results, those that have been derived in collaboration with the OECS. And the second factor is the ongoing management of risk, both internal risks, so things that we can control within the program, as well as external risks. I mean, no one obviously would have uh, anticipated uh, not just COVID's emergence, but its extended global impact. Um, but those are honestly, things that are part of the facts of life. And those are the sorts of things that we will continue to, to monitor, uh, not necessarily to, to, to manage as in the sense of controlling, but to monitor and to seek to influence uh, the delivery of the products under this project. So in my final um, in, uh, intervention, I'll just speak briefly about the theory of change underlying this project. And this is important, again, going back to the point of the fact that this project sits as one piece of the bigger puzzle. Bigger puzzle being what must be done to strengthen the, the overall ecosystems for entrepreneurship and innovation in the OECS, 
um, from all various dimensions and including everything that, for example, are in those frameworks that both Annie and Kwesi presented. Um, some of you would be already quite familiar with the, the concept of a theory of change, but I'll just speak uh, briefly that it includes both a, a logic model or impact pathway that connects uh, the activities right through to outputs, right through to a se sequence of, of outcomes, but also the assumptions, the causal assumptions. What are the, the, the things that we are assuming that would make those links stand firm and would make those links hold in the real world? Um, we don't have time to, to go over the assumptions in, in depth, line by line, but I will touch briefly on the, the core elements of the, the, the logic model. Perhaps in the Q&A, we could tease out some more of those assumptions. So firstly, and I recognize there's a lot of text on this page, so let me break it down. The components that they basically lay out how the program carries out its work to achieve the objectives that I've laid out previously. The outputs are obviously the direct products of those activities. And the immediate outcomes are the short-term changes in awareness or in attitude that we expect to realize shortly after the 24 month execution period for this project. So uh, as I represented it previously, there's a, a business incubation component, there's an acceleration component. You would notice that the component three on financial services isn't on the screen, that's not an oversight. It is for the reason as I said earlier, that we are really intending to um, refine exactly what those activities are, but our expectation is that they will also complement the activities under components one and two and lead to a, a cohesive whole. Um, I won't go through line by line all the various outcomes at this point. Um, we can touch on them a bit later as well because I'm recognizing the time. Uh, then this is the other side of the, the logic model. Um, this is the side that over the lifetime of this project, we will not get to uh, in practical terms, we won't be, be able to, to measure these over the course of the next 24 months. But the expectation is with this as with any other logic model that um, were an evaluation to take place in the, the medium to long term and looking retrospectively over the impact that this project has had, that the, the direct results that we could have controlled and would have been immediately evident would have contributed to in the face of other activities and other assumptions, these more intermediate and long-term and the ultimate outcome that the OECS is, is driving to in terms of its development. So the, those intermediate outcomes speak to medium-term changes in knowledge, understanding and or capacity. The long-term outcomes really speak to long-term change in behavior. When we get to the point where this new normal, this term that has become so prevalent in the case of COVID, it really establishes itself um, in the in the day-to-day the, the -day lives of people uh, in the region. Um, so for example, I mean, we spoke about, you know, uh, uh, cash-based, uh, having such cash-based economies and, and limited um, access to digital financial services. So the expectation is not within the 24 months, but over the long term, that new normal would be reestablished in a different form and ultimately to the ultimate outcomes. So. Uh, again, I think in the interest of time, we won't go through step by step. Certainly when we come to the Q&A, we can revisit some of these slides and interrogate some more of the, the specific um, outputs and immediate outcomes for this project. So at this point, I will conclude um, by thanking uh, the OECS, thanking my colleagues and turning it back over to you, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Karen, for the presentation. Um, and to all the panelists for their presentations um, this morning, we are about to get into the question and answer session. Um, but I just want to um, set out what we want to achieve um, in the next um, 45 minutes or so of discussions. You have heard the presentation of the technical of the project. Um, you have seen briefly the logic model and the results chain. Um, and what we want to do is to understand from you, the, from the participants, what are some of the things that um, may have been missed? What are the challenges um, that we need to take um, into account? What are the assumptions that we need to, to make? What are, you know, so that we can strengthen. This afternoon, we're going to, um, between the OECS and the Caribbean, 
to finalize the, the, the project in terms of the um, results stream, the logic model um, that Karen just presented. But it's really important to hear from you what are the things that we need to take into account. Um, and some of the questions I've already pointed um, to that um, so that we can improve um, on, the, on the project. As Karen just mentioned, this initiative, which is a very good one, can only just be the start. We can only address some of the challenges. Um, and there are other things that will need to be addressed with other initiatives. Certainly there are other um, projects that are taking place or that are in the pipeline. So the importance of linkages and synergies, both at the national and the regional level, will be important. The whole issue of the policy, legislative and regulatory framework for entrepreneurship and innovation is not really being directly tackled by this project because the focus is on the ecosystem and therefore on the players in the ecosystem that interact with uh, and that the entrepreneur needs support from or needs to get services from and support from um, so that he can succeed. But the wider environment um, and the policy framework for entrepreneurship is key. That needs to be supported and where you can identify the weaknesses and the gaps um, as we are seeking to do, that will be important as well, because this is an area that the CBU um, will be seeking to advocate for and to, and to address in the relevant organs of the OECS at the regional level and to support and work with member states in implementing the necessary regulatory and policy and legislative framework at the national level for, for entrepreneurship and, and innovation. So I invite you to raise your hands, as I indicated, um, to ask questions or to um, uh, indicate some of the questions in the chat. I see there is um, one question already, um, or one raised hand um, in the chat, uh, and I will um, invite you. So let me just say your name. I don't know if from our panelists if there was any clarification of question before I do so from any of you um, in terms of the way forward. Um, if not, then Julie Manlius, um, I will um, unmute you now. Um, please, if you can, um, introduce yourself um, and the agency organization or institution um, that you may be um, associated with and to ask your question as briefly as, as possible. Um, Julie Manilas. Manilas. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, please proceed. Uh, so yes, yeah, so my question was uh, regarding, so sorry, I'm just going to present myself. So my name is Julie, I'm from Guadeloupe. Uh, I'm the founder of the organization Connect uh, French West Indies that aims to educate locals on the hemp and the cannabis industry. And my question was really regarding this industry and this sector. So how um, OESC basically will be able to help um, entrepreneurs to establish um, their companies in this type of um, industry. So we know that this industry is, is attracting a lot of big companies from the US and Canada, but basically what is done for Caribbean uh, people in order to create uh, businesses in this industry. Uh, I can't hear you anymore. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. So thank you very much, um, Ms. Manlias, for your question. Um, I will um, be passing the questions to our panelists. Um, maybe uh, one of them can, um, from the OECS, maybe Ms. Flood or the DG. Uh, I know that issue has, um, in terms of that sector, is one of the areas um, a number of the member states have already started taking policy decisions on, um, on the development of that sector. Um, there might be need for some regional um, approaches and decisions, but I will leave the panelists to, to, to tackle, tackle that. Any other questions? Let me just um, point to some of the questions. Uh, I see one from Mr. Felix Lewis, who I know is um, the CEO of um, the 
St. Vincent and CEV and Center for Enterprise Development. Um, and he's asking, how are we going to ensure that our initiatives in development of the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem in the subregion is properly resourced in terms of finance and human resources? Um, pointing out that we cannot afford to underscore this effort and uh, under resource this effort and we have too much hope for the future riding on this. So the important issue here of um, resource, resources, both financial and um, human resource for, for this um, has been raised by him. Mr. David Headley, Headley uh, what synergies, technical support or capacity building support exists for OECS members to benefit at the national level from their respective programs being undertaken to support the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So what synergies, technical support or capacity building um, exists for OECS members to benefit at the national level from the initiatives? Um, but certainly for this, I think the, there's a role for the OECS CBU in terms of mobilizing resources and implementing programs for capacity building and institutional strengthening for example, of national DSO. This is one of the key areas that we are um, a priority area of our work at the CBU. Um, but I will also um, pass this question up to our panel. And just one more question from the question and answer. Is there any research for cultural tourism that identifies how much visitors are willing to pay for authentic experience? So let me pass the floor to our, um, any in our panel who may wish to answer some of these questions that have been raised. Ricardo, can you repeat the question from Julie Manias, please? Yes. Um, it's also in the chat. So she is the founder of uh, Connect FWI, uh, an organization that aims to educate locals on the hem and the cannabis industry. So how is the OECS, how can the OECS help Caribbean residents to be part of the cannabis industry in terms of entrepreneurship? Um, this industry, of course, is attracting a number of big companies in the US and Canada. Um, but what about the youth who would love to create business related to medical cannabis in the Caribbean? So the issue is what, how are we, how, what role or what place for this sector, um, the hemp and cannabis sector? What are the initiatives, the policy initiatives um, for supporting that sector in the OECS? So that's the question. Okay. Uh, I, I well, would like okay. to suggest, I, I, so I hope DG is still there because maybe he can address that as well. I think the first step is perhaps to get a cohesive policy um, from the OECS on cannabis. Um, because at this point, we, we are not at that stage to my understanding. I know some countries like St. Vincent have been, have been advanced with it. Um, while we are supporting businesses across the board, um, we do not have at this point a, a one coherent policy from the OECS member states on cannabis. If nobody can add to, to, the, to the answer, perhaps we can take the next question. Our time is rather short. Ricardo, you are muted. Also pointed, I'd also pointed to the question of on resources for Mr. Felix Lewis. Um, how do we ensure that um, it is properly resourced in terms of finance and human resources? Our wow. initiatives for enterprise development and innovation both at the regional and at the national level. I think here the point is that the need for resource mobilization from our development partners, but also to find some innovative ways to, um, to raise resources um, that we need to pursue um, to ensure that um, we can make maximum use of the limited resources that we have. It could also be important to, um, for collaboration and working together so that we can um, generate some synergies, um, both between the national and regional initiatives at CARICOM, including OECS as well as OECS.
Well, I don't know if Casey can, can, can add to this. Um, I couldn't find the question somehow on my screen, but um, I think you've kind of addressed it. It has to be from a multiplicity of, of um, sources. One, of course, is the, the stakeholders that we are bringing on board to, to support in the incubation and acceleration environment. We are bringing stakeholders on board. One, to, to basically, in terms of the mentorship and the training, to build capacity among SMEs that they themselves become more equipped to, to attract resources. Um, there was a general mention, some of the FinTech solutions, we are using the technology, how businesses can actually have better access. One of the questions, one of the things that we are dealing with is access to finance. Um, equipping businesses in, in fine tuning their business models, their pitch so that they too can be better able to go, um, I would say go after, but to, to seek funding. There's a whole host of avenues, venture capital funding, bringing it between venture capitalists, we are doing the, the business pitch competition right now under the SDM. And here's an opportunity we are bringing investors on board, people who may be able to, to inject equity even into businesses. So um, it is not a single thing, but it is um, basically equipping our SMEs or our businesses to optimize, to take advantage of the different avenues and opportunities that exist to raise funding for their businesses. I also think Heron mentioned that we are taking a little time to fine tune the FinTech um, component of this project. I think it's mainly because too, we want to be sure that we take the, we, what the activities that we implement there, we really maximizing the opportunities to be able to attract financing to those, to those um, entrepreneurs. I hope that okay. answers. Yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Annie, may I also invite you? To, to give some comments on some of the questions that we have um, heard so far. Okay, sure, um, Ricardo. So on the first question related to cannabis, I would say from the perspective of, of, uh, of Compi Caribbean, we currently have a uh, funding opportunity called the Blockchain Innovation Initiative, which is open at the moment, and it provides funding for using blockchain solutions that solve a particular problem. In the case of the cannabis, because it is a, uh, an area that is contentious for many individuals and including the government because of the policies and all and so forth. Uh, it is critical that this particular sector starts to integrate into their operations a tracing system using technology that enables the source so that you don't you especially when in the countries where medical uh, cannabis is legal. Uh, because obviously complete Karen will not support anything that is not illegal that is not yet legal but uh, for medical purposes you may have certain strains of cannabis that is allowed but in order for that to be uh, legitimate uh, it, it sometimes will need to be traced properly to the source and making sure that it doesn't have certain chemicals in it so therefore uh, blockchain technology can be used for um, for, for, for tracing, I'm, I'm, I'm just using cannabis and it is an example in countries where it is legal, but it, the blockchain technology can be used for tracing uh, of different products like cocoa, for example, and others. Now, in terms of the second question, um, the related to the making sure to find out to, how, how do we ensure that the, the uh, ecosystem- uh, Sorry, uh, I, I need to use that as an example, but just to state that, Unfortunately, IDB cannot support um, the cannabis sectors yet. So I think she, she's talking in traceability in general, but IDB, that's just to be clear that everyone understands. Unfortunately, that's still on the ban list, just to be clear. Yeah, okay. So thank you, Russell. Now, in terms of finding out about the, the, the uh, making sure that it's properly sourced, both maybe financially and with uh, human resources, the entrepreneurship and ecosystem that we're trying to strengthen in the, eco, the OECS, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to bring in uh, consultants who will run a competition and leave. And then therefore there is nothing that is really sustainable. What we're really trying to do with the component one and two that Kieran described is that we're trying to find a way to establish this uh, incubation and, and acceleration services in a way that it is viable and sustainable on its own. Therefore, 
uh, this uh, entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem or this incubator and accelerators will have to find a way at some point to get uh, revenue streams. So, you know, we can support financially initially, but eventually if this is going to be sustainable, it has to be uh, self-financing. And um, that's why we are also talking about an ecosystem because normally these uh, incubators and accelerator programs are sponsored. And so uh, it may be difficult for, for these incubators and accelerators when, when they are not government uh, run per se to be financed by government. But this is why this, again, the importance of the interactions with the ecosystem, because at the national level, there are certain activities that can be done by the BSOs that are financed by government, but integrated within the incubator, incubator and accelerator that would be providing additional or complementary support. Um, and then the last question about the, the youth. Uh, in the incubators, uh, we did not talk about pre-incubation services, but pre-incubation services are focused on helping to refine or develop the products and services. And oftentimes they can be incorporated into incubator services, but pre-incubator services can be take the form of, for example, a hackathon or boot camps. We have found uh, recently that boot camps actually that train young people on how to code can lead to greater revenues for them than, and, and they don't necessarily need uh, a computer science degree. So they're looking for the boot camps, the new boot camps that exist, or some maybe less the hackathon, but hackathon are useful again to also um, get involved some young people. But the boot camp can uh, can involve young people that do not necessarily have the typical university or technical degree, but help them teach them some skills that can be used to embrace the digital economy. So that was more my comment. Thank you very much, Annie, for those responses. Um, we can now take a question from Mr. Felix Lewis, um, who uh, uh, a question that I read from earlier, but he has raised his hand, so probably expound on that. So, Mr. Lewis, welcome and thank you. Um, you are now unmuted. Sorry, there is. Um, Yes, you are now on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, um, two things. And one of it related to the question I had in the Q&A chat room. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the past, because I've been in this business for more than 20 something years. And one of the things that keep repeating is that we keep implementing parts of what are necessary, initiatives that are necessary to um, achieve the objective. But when we look at the ecosystem concept, um, many there are a number of different things that have to be implemented at the same time in concert um, in order for it to succeed. For instance, um, if we look at the current situation, one of the, the gaps that we have is the, the um, digital transaction facilitation, especially through the financial institutions as they exist. So for instance, for people who want to get into e-commerce, um, there's still uh, legislative gaps. There are still issues in relation to financial services that really would not make that um, feasible in any meaningful way without setting up an account uh, maybe in the US to facilitate your transaction clearing. Um, the, the, essentially what I'm saying is that if we're going to make an effort of this, what I don't want us to do is to tinker around the edges and then um, even though these initiatives are good, they may not um, result in the type of impact that we anticipate because several other critical elements are missing. So for instance, the issue of equity financing, um, the process of um, transforming ideas into commercial, um, practical commercial entities. Those are not simple processes and they have to be part of the mix in the ecosystem to, to be able to, to, to leverage our creativity, our invention and so on. And building up the culture of, um, 
of IP protections and so on in the region. A lot of people, um, when they do a business plan, there's not even two lines that are talking about intellectual property or intellectual property protections. Um, and I think that um, it reflected in the results I saw earlier in one of the, the slides where they say that very few registrations happening in the region. It doesn't mean ideas are not generated, but many individuals are not open to the concept of actually going to a CPO and doing a registration, either patent registration or other registration. Um, so it's not, the, the creativity is not reflected in the registration process because the culture of making those registrations are not really here in the OECS. So I'm saying that um, we have to, this one of the reasons why the question comes up, that we have to make sure that all of the critical necessary elements to succeed in this are implemented, are implemented simultaneously, and um, resource in a way that we ensure that, you know, we, we at least give ourselves a chance of succeeding. Um, what I don't want to see is that we continue what we have done in the past, where we implement some really good projects, but they can't succeed because other things are missing. And we can't sustain those interventions. So um, that, that's my concern. Um, I want to make sure that um, this initiative has, will succeed where others have failed. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Lewis, for those comments. And I think you um, made a very important point there about the, the wider policy framework and the wider ecosystem that we need to have a more coherent and a cohesive and an integrated approach to this. And I think this is something that we recognize um, at the OECS um, because separate and individual interventions that are not linked to a broader policy framework um, for entrepreneurship and innovation at the OECS and at, at the regional level and at the national level um, is very important. Um, any comments from the panelists um, to that question? Um, I'll, just, I'll just add a, a brief one. Um, okay, I think, Ricardo, your, your response there, I, I mean, put it this way, I think Felix has hit upon a, a, a crucial issue. And just to, to draw a comparison, uh, in, in Jamaica, for example, the, the government of Jamaica has recently come to an agreement with the IDB for a loan to support the development of its own ecosystem for entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, a loan to the tune of 50 million US to be, the, the down play, to be drawn out through two tranches of 25 million each over, I believe, a, a five or 10 year period. Now, I use those details to speak to the point which I think Felix was hitting on, which is that you are going to require a significant amount of resources to make the sort of sustained um, impact that, that Felix and, and others are looking to. Now, if you were to scale that sort of investment back to, towards the size and using a rough calculation on the basis of population, not even looking at, at economic um, uh, comparative, but on the basis of population, that might look like a 10 million US in investment for the OECS. So to come to that point, that is why uh, I had made a, a very brief point very early on, but I'll restate it here. It is critical for the OECS as a union, and, and I, I would you know, humbly suggest um, as through the focal point of the OECS commission, then pursuing that sort of level of resourcing um, to, to bring, the, on, bring to board the, the collective resource pool that will be required to have that sort of sustained impact that I think Felix is speaking to. Um, that being the case, I mean, many of the different initiatives that uh, our colleagues have presented before, they are part of the mix as well. So we need to be realistic about how, how to, to best interlink all those other pieces to approach uh, in, a, in a realistic and a pragmatic way that overall picture for addressing all the different pieces of the ecosystem. Uh, thanks, Karen. One of the questions that we got from- so That is um, what I would suggest. Uh, in terms of, uh, that, 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 that. Thanks, Karen. One of the questions that we got from Mr. Dave Headley was, what is being done with regards to entrepreneurship in the education system at the secondary and primary school level? Um, he noticed that Dr. Jules had talked about the issue in the technical schools and colleges in the region. 
And I think that speaks to the issue of, um, you know, the entrepreneurship mindset, um, even the entrepreneurship culture. Um, what are we doing in terms of educating young people to become entrepreneurs at a very early stage? Um, I know in this project um, and in the logic model that we have done, we had to make a number of assumptions. Uh, I mean, we are doing this initiative. We are um, seeking to have a program for incubation, for acceleration. Um, but we recognize that some assumptions have to be made of things that need to happen elsewhere that this project is not tackling um, in terms of the success and achieving the outcomes and the, the goals of this project. And one of them might be in terms of education, right, Karen? Um, or Annie, you may want to speak to that um, because this is critical. Um, so just briefly to touch on that, I think to the point of um, assumptions as it relates to you know other initiatives that may be required uh, earlier in the pipeline, as it were, before coming to, to our TC and our program here, is really better understanding initiatives that are already underway, that are already resourced within the region, within the OECS. So in as much as there are efforts, I think Dr. Jules would have spoken to, to some of them, perhaps driven by the OECS Commission, perhaps driven by others, to really drill down the education on entrepreneurship and, and innovation and its importance down into the school age level. Those efforts, we need to be made um, more directly aware of those efforts and similarly to make the, the person driving those efforts more aware of what we are doing to enhance the synergy. But again, due to the the, the, I mean, choices always have to be made. And due to the, the size of the, the budget that we have to work with, due to the need to really to make selections about what to focus on, what not to focus on, uh, we have in collaboration with, with you all at the OECS made decisions as it pertains to what this program will cover. Taken away from it, really just need to better understand all the initiatives that are in place and ensure that, that they are linked. Yes, thank you very much, um, Kyra. Um, participants, you are encouraged to, um, to raise your hands or to type in your questions. I think the, in the chat there, were, there was a question about how long did it take to develop the proposed plan of action? That is after the mapping and the assessment that was done. Kyra responded to that in the chat. Um, the, it was completed in April 2019, the approval in January 2020. Um, and the study, the, the study diagnosis was completed and presented in April 2019, and the TC, um, just a little under a year, um, well, a year later in January 2020. And there is a question here about timeline when is the rollout of this program? When is the call for BSUs, et cetera? For the accelerators and incubators. Well, the rollout, the project is a two-year project, and I think Kyra mentioned that it was two years um, from the time that the TC agreement was signed, and it was signed probably just uh, to, uh, about a month ago, um, uh, under a month ago. Um, we hope to finalize all the project documentation um, this week and or within the coming week so that we can begin to, an, a request for expressions of interest should be going out and very soon um, to um, interest to um, DSOs, intermediaries, who could provide the incubation and, and acceleration um, and program for components one and two. And then shortly after that, the TORs um, will be issued in terms of the procurement process. So we really hope um, to do this as quickly as possible because we, don't, we need to do this within the time frame set up for this project. So those interested, please um, look out for the request for expressions of interest, as well as in terms of reference on the call um, for tenders. Um, um, this will be led, of course, by the OECS CBU. We have to, we are handling the procurement of this according to IDB policies, and it should commence within the coming weeks. Ricardo, I just would like to add something, if possible, about the education aspect. So, 
Um, yes. I, I did not emphasize that, but you know, when we have many business support organizations, often sometimes it creates some sort of competition among them for resources. And also, let's say they one of them would 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 develop great strong educational material, then they would want to keep it so that they can attract more entrepreneurs um, uh, to their own organization. But what has happened, I think, in recent uh, months because of COVID is that there is an increased interest for online learning. And so now there's a proliferation of online training content that has been coming up, lots of webinars happening. And um, people see that um, that is no longer um, a competitive advantage to, to keep the information for yourself. So I see that there's an increased interest among business support organizations and donor and development agencies to share material. For example, we recently hired a consultant to conduct, uh, uh, to provide the training material on, to help creative entrepreneurs to um, learn more about their, um, their, their, their intellectual property, but also the copyrights and, and so on. And the, the, the legal um, ad consultant who developed the content was supposed to travel to different countries in the OECS and the other countries in the Caribbean to train um, the copyright society and their members on the different options available to them, um, especially as we are moving into more online cells. Now, this content uh, is now being transformed from a in-person training program that was supposed to be delivered to an online training uh, mod to online training modules, but obviously online training for teaching legal complicated content is not that um, easy to do. And it's very hard for anybody to keep your attention, focus on something that is so complex as legal terms. So therefore we have decided to use the budget that was initially allocated to traveling to travels for the consultants to these countries to then develop animated videos that would teach the legal, uh, the legal content, as well as use production companies that as source in the Caribbean. So that is an example of how now this content is going to be accessible online and it's gonna be accessible at the, you know, let's say Felix at the CED can now use this material. Anybody, any business support organization will be able to, to, to mobilize their own clients and use this online training material to train their own clients. Same thing with the OECS Secretariat, which will now eventually have access to online training modules. These online training modules, even though it will be sitting at the OES Secretariat's website, any business support organization in the region will be able to take those online modules and use them to train their own entrepreneurs. So we're really looking at um, collaboration among all of the stakeholders. And that's my comment. Thank you very much, much Annie, for, for that. Um, any other other questions? I think we um, we have just sort of caught up with with the time and the timeline in terms of our our our, our agenda. Um, but the question and answer session was meant to go a little bit longer, so let me give a chance for others to um, do some questions in the chat. Um, we don't have any. Yeah, so there is a, can you see that the TURs, so there's a question, can you see the TUR for expressions of interest should be out by the end of June and should I which website? Okay, um, the TURs and the expressions of interest should be out within the coming weeks. Um, and I think a top, not more than two weeks from now. Um, and it would be, um, we would be issuing it, so it would be on the OCS um, um, using our channels. We will send it to Target, we'll put it on our website, because we would be working with our procurement unit um, and how they normally issue these calls for tenders. So it would be on our website um, to be accessed by interested parties. Um, we could also send it um, to our net, to our um, contact of um, BSOs and interested persons who might be interested. It will be an open, well, as I said, there will be a request for extension of expressions of interest. Um, maybe, and then we, from that, we can probably select, we will be following the IADB rules on this process. So we'll probably provide greater information on that um, before the end of 
So, any other questions? Um, and because if not, I mean, the next agenda item was wrap up conclusions and recommendations. Um, where what I would, be, would ask is each of the panel to um, to give their concluding remarks on what you have heard before. Um, what I can say in terms of the, and I would invite my colleague um, Tracy to come in to give any summary of what has been said um, in terms of the points that have been raised and to invite the panelists um, to, to give their closing remarks and we will give um, the way forward um, on the next steps. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I saw a raised hand from Felix. I was not sure if that was uh, an, a recent, um, a recent. Um, uh, I see of, there's a new yes. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure if he wanted to come back in. Um, yes, let me so, yes because I had on I had um, lowered his hand. So, Mr. Lewis. Yeah, I, I um. I don't know. I, I wanted to, to just mention something about the cannabis industry um, from the St. Vincent perspective. I, I know somebody asked a question in relation to that and the focus on um, opportunities for young people. I don't know if you want me to, to give um, some of the situation in St. Vincent in relation to that because I'm willing to share what, from what information I have. Um, as you know, St. Vincent is, is one of the, the countries that uh, way ahead in terms of the what they have in place um, to establish an industry, medical cannabis industry. Um, it includes a functioning um, cannabis authority, which have been functioning for more than a year now. Um, the legislation is already in place. The institutional arrangements are more or less complete. And um, people have started activities in a number of areas. Uh, including research and um, development of products, extraction of essential oils and so on from cannabis. Um, all of these things, there are actually plants being built at the moment and construction going on for some of these facilities. Um, but in St. Vincent, they have carved out a portion, um, what we call for the traditional um, cannabis pro producers to participate in the medical marijuana um, um, industry. So they, they have some special provisions to allow, accommodate and support young people and others who have been previous to now illegally planting cannabis. So for them to transition into um, the legal framework for the medical cannabis production. So, so that, that's actually ongoing at the same time that the more um, significant industrial level um, investments are happening. I think that recently they have um, come up with an agreement with Canada for export. I think that is one of a few countries that they have now established the uh, arrangement to actually export the products um, and services out of the cannabis industry. So they are, they are very far ahead in implementation. Of course, like everything else, COVID has um, slowed down somewhat the progress. But um, yes, uh, uh, in response to the question, um, there are provisions to make sure that the local um, individuals who are interested in the industry um, have some space to operate in this industry in St. Vincent. And um, so it's not it's a situation where we lock out small investors and local investors. So I just wanted to add that little two cents so to give them some idea of what is happening already in some parts of the OECS. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I, there's also a new question from Dr. Eisenhower Douglas. Um, Dr. Douglas, um, if you are uh, I willing, I could unmute you so that you could ask the question um, directly. Dr. Douglas, are you able to speak? Dr. Douglas? Yes, yes, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay, well, you know, this thing about the ecosystem is sort of 
of recent vintage. I just wanted to confirm that when we speak of the enabling environment for business, that phrase is synonymous with the business ecosystem. I just wanted to confirm that you know, we're talking the same language. So it's a question of really definition. Are these two things, you know, synonymous? Thank you very much. Um, does any my colleagues, Kyron or Annie, want to address that? Um, I have an answer, but let me invite you or Chrissy. Um, yes, so from my perspective, so I would say certainly when we speak of that business ecosystem or when we speak of that enabling environment, we're really speaking, as I outlined before, of that business ecosystem that allows for um, startups to develop and thrive um, within the, the existing environment and all of that supporting infrastructure and programs that contribute to the development of and growth of startups within the ecosystem. So we did go through that in terms of also defining um, that, that uh, whole perspective of startups and entrepreneurs earlier. Yeah. Maybe some of my colleagues might, might want to chime in on that as well. Yeah, I misunderstood the question, sorry. Yes, the question is um, the enabling environment for business versus the business ecosystem or the ecosystem, the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Are these two synonymous? Um, no, I... That's an interesting question. Um, the, the, uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem involved, involves different stakeholders and the interaction among the stakeholders is critical to strengthen the ecosystem that support the entrepreneurs. The difference is, is that the uh, business in itself is, um, it in itself has, is led by an entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur has control about about what is going on inside his business. So the business may involve different, different, different operations and it may require different support services, but you have control over the business environment. Um, so that's the key difference, I guess, in the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem, it, it involves a lot more stakeholders and it depends on a lot more factors in order to be successful. Not, I'm not sure if that helps. Thank you, Annie. Just to add to, to that, um, usually, the, the, the enabling environment for business um, usually is broader, might be broader because it would encompass the whole policy, legislative and regulatory framework um, for, for business or for entrepreneurship. So that is the laws, the regulations, the various institutions. Um, and this is usually largely in the domain of the, of the public sector and the governments. So if you, if you imagine the environment um, if you look at ecology as the example, the environment will be climate, temperature, you know, weather, and all these things. The ecosystem is the various biological entities and how they react. So in the eco um, entrepreneurship ecosystem, that is the entrepreneur or the business and the different players and stakeholders that he needs to interact with for him to produce his goods and services, whether it's the um, financial institutions where he needs to get his finances or the logistic services where he needs to so, um, get his goods inputs in and his goods out and transport services, whether it is the quality infrastructure where it is a need for the testing and certification of his products to get into the market. All of the wide variety of business support services where the public sector and private sector um, that helps for enterprise development, business support, even outsourcing of services, whether it's marketing and advertising. All of these players are the ecosystem. So for the entrepreneur, um, that means particularly for an entrepreneur, it means finance, it's the incubator, it's the accelerator services, it's the investors, the angel investors, development banks, all of the things that an entrepreneur needs in terms of starting up, in terms of incubation, in terms of scaling up. Those are the players in the ecosystem. But if the wider eco um, environment is not enabling, if the legislative framework is in there to support, even supporting the functioning of the ecosystem, that can be the challenge. So one, from my perspective, is that one is a, the in environment is broader, it encompasses the wider elements um, and usually informs the legislative framework, the policy framework, 
the regulatory framework and including the institutional framework, the, in the ecosystem of the different players and stakeholders and how they interact with each other. I don't know if there's, um, I hope that answers your question, um, Dr. Douglas. Yes, it did. Very, very helpful. Thank you very much for the clarification. Just not to, to believe, but the point, but just to quickly tag on to your response, Ricardo. I yes. think I really want to underscore Annie's previous presentation where we really distinguish between opportunity-driven opportunity entrepreneurship and versus needs-based entrepreneurship. So I, I say that then, um, not all business uh, is, is, is equal. I don't mean in terms of value, but in terms of what it can to the overall growth and the resilience of, of the economy. As you pointed to, when we speak to an ecosystem for entrepreneurship, we're really talking about the specialized services that are required to, to help build and drive um, startups as well as existing businesses who really want to expand and scale and integrate technology. Now, that is a part of, um, but it, it is by no means dealing with all the other elements, just standard elements of, of running and setting up business in any country. Things like registration, getting permits and all, you know, uh, accounting and, and finance services and those sorts of things. Yeah, so hopefully that didn't um, muddy the waters, but just wanted to underline that point as well. Uh, thank you, Karen. But I think it's an important point because it, rec it, it points to the fact that um, the point, the fact that point that was being made by um, Mr. Lewis and others that for ultimate success um, and achieving the ultimate outcomes um, for this project, because in your presentation when you showed the um, logic model, um, you had the outputs, the immediate outcome, the intermediate outcome, the long term outcome, and then the ultimate outcome. When we get to that ultimate outcome, there's really a lot of other things that has to be assumed that are existing or that would need to be addressed by other initiatives um, to get to that ultimate outcome. So, I mean, this initiative, what can only be directly attributed to it in terms of the incubation and acceleration program are probably the, definitely the outputs and the intermediate outcomes or outputs. Once it gets beyond that, there are other things that would need to be at play um, in terms of getting that success. So the issue, the distinction between even what we're doing in the ecosystem, we are only talking about incubation and acceleration, but we are not talking so much about the nature of finance, access to finance, the nature of um, invest, investor, access to investors and different equity financing mechanisms that needs to be there so that an investor not only has to go to a commercial bank or even a development bank, but can he get access to equity financing um, in, in the OECS. So those are some of the other things that need to be addressed. Okay, colleagues, um, I see no other. Okay, they muted me. Hello, so thanks colleagues. So I'm um, sorry if I, I thought it was muted. I see no other questions from the chat or from the question and answer panel. So we can then move on to the next session, um, which is the wrap up. What I would want to do then is to invite my colleague Chrissy to just give a brief summary, um, not necessarily capturing everything that all that has been said, but to um, give a wrap up and conclusions. I will invite um, each of the panelists who are still present. I know um, Miss Emmanuel Flood had to leave for 12 o'clock for another meeting. Um, but I would invite my, the panelists to give any closing remarks that they may want to give. And then we can then indicate, um, as Chrissy, you and I will then indicate what the next steps, what, what will be the next steps um, in this project. So Chrissy, the floor is open to you. Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. Um, thanks for actually for um, the the hosting and um, chairing of the session and um, for outlining actually the activities and so that um, are being undertaken. Um, generally, based on the discussions highlighted so far, I mean, there were several issues raised uh, in regards to the OECS ecosystem and consideration to 
the types of activities that could be undertaken within the ecosystem. Um, or from our perspective, we do have to consider this project in terms of what is possible and what can be done um, within the scope of this, this particular activity. Um, we did look at um, uh, several activities, basically in terms of the incubation and acceleration components of this project. Um, and I, I think several questions were raised considering the sustainability um, and the scalability as well of this particular intervention. So those are certainly considered. Um, as far as the support program to SMEs, well, we, we intend to work directly and specifically with national business service organizations to support and implement such an activity within member states. Um, but we have identified through this discussion, um, further to previous studies and discussions that we have had, um, the issues of um, support and implementation for uh, programs for SMEs within the member states. Um, so considering those challenges really, we really focused on that discussion about how do we provide a or uh, present a program that provides and supports the um, the entrepreneurship development and ecosystem program within the member states. So, um, bearing in mind that this project um, has some sort of constraints in terms of financing, but it also supports and um, it also the intention is also to support fintech solutions for SMEs who intend to. Um, access and utilize fintech solutions to scale their businesses as well. So that's also a very important part of this. Um, and um, just to say, well, based on the points that were raised earlier, um, certainly we will be working with national business service organizations. And I think based on my um, presentation earlier to support and provide that um, additional support and sustainability um, for business service organizations to partner and implement this program. And I outlined some of the programs that we are working on as well within the member states to, to undertake that. So I just wanted to highlight those points um, and um, this is it as well. Thanks for um, the opportunity to speak on this particular issue. Thanks very much, um, Chrissy, um, for that. I don't know if Kyron and uh, Annie has any final remarks to make before I um, close up with the, the way forward. Okay, I'll leave the final uh, remark to Kieran, who is the um, managing this entire initiative from our side. But I wanted just to say that I'm very hopeful because um, the in the OECS in particular, there is, a, although access to finance is a challenge and also access to financial services is a challenge, the capital is, the, there is liquidity that is accessible. It's just that, the, the, no, I shouldn't say accessible, there is liquidity that is there. It's just that it's not accessible. It's hidden under the mattress or it's hidden in the bank account. So what we, if we are able to develop entrepreneurs of opportunities and help existing businesses grow and scale, leveraging everything we discussed before, then I believe that we, will, we could then move forward in the strengthening of the ecosystem and bring in opportunities for investors to come together and invest uh, angel investment or uh, venture capital to start investing in those businesses. So I think that is the vision and that is the way forward. But the good news is that I think it's, it's feasible. So that was my final remark. And thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Annie, for your for these comments and for your presentation. Kyron? Uh, right. So firstly, I just want to once again commend and thank uh, Dr. Jules and the entire OECS Commission for being steadfast partners with us in this project. Um, you know, from its inception to now. And obviously, we, I think we're all aware that uh, the real work, as it were, really starts now for us to, to bring the intended uh, um, 
products and, and, and benefits of this project to its beneficiaries, the, the firms and the SMEs and the entrepreneurs in the OACS. Um, so with that, uh, we are, you know, continue to be ready to, to go and to support the OACS Commission in taking things forward. And like Annie, I am also uh, op quite optimistic and hopeful of the impact that this project will have and is in fact even now having in that as we've, we've, we've laid out, it is not the, the be all and end all, not that anyone is expecting it to be, but it is an important component. It's an important uh, uh, leg in the overall relay uh, towards supporting the OACS's economic and social development. So we continue to, to support and are thankful for your support as well. Thank you very much, Kyron, for, for this. And uh, it has already been said, but let me just reiterate the thanks um, on behalf of the Director General and my Director, Ms. Flood, and the OECS Commission and the, and the CBU for all of the work that you and Annie and Dr. Dunhurt um, and the rest of the Complete Caribbean and IADB team in Russell for over the past several months in getting to the stage, in developing the TC technical cooperation agreement, in working on the logical framework, the logic model. And now we are about to, to start off um, this project in terms of um, issuing requests for um, expressions of interest and that we can get to the stage of um, receiving some tenders and making a selection of the best candidates for the provision of the incubation and acceleration services. We really hope that we can complete that process in terms of getting the tenders out there um, within two weeks. We intend to do so, um, so that we can, um, once we go through the tendering process, the procurement process, the selection process, um, we can begin to actually get to the call for what will be handled by the selective um, provider, contractor, who would then working with us at CBU handle the call for um, the search for um, startups, um, early stage businesses, and high growth potential firms or components one and two. Um, we are very much excited about this. Um, component three, we are going to work on to flesh that out in terms of identifying the specific activities that will be undertaken to use the limited resources there. Um, we do recognize that there is more that will need to be done. So at the CBU, at the OECS, we will continue our engagements. Um, the ECCB is a major player in that space. Um, the pilot for the digital Eastern Caribbean dollar has already started. Um, and that would expand later on to the rest of the OECS. And that's a major platform depending for um, increasing the optic of fintech in the OECS. But we have to engage other stakeholders. There are other players that are doing initiatives in creating different forms of wallets um, and, and mechanisms for um, digital payments using mobile technology um, and other means. All of this, of course, has to be done in a sort of framework that is unified a regulatory framework that is unified, that is cohesive and coherent um, so that things are done and swiftly. Um, we will continue our efforts at CBU because we recognize um, we need to address broader issues in the, um, in the environment, the um, policy framework, the legislative framework and the regulatory framework. Um, we will seek to um, engage in I guess as part of our work program for the next year um, to see how we can engage in discussions and consultation with stakeholders to continue the conversation that we started today on strengthening not just the ecosystem for entrepreneurship, but strengthening the framework, the, the, the policy framework for entrepreneurship. What needs to be done? What are sort of the laws and policies that need to be implemented um, nationally and regionally? And so we would want to engage in discussions with stakeholders at the national level. The ultimate goal would be to have something to present to our relevant ministers um, at the OECS level um, for decision making, for deliberation and decision making. Um, that could lead to possible um, reform at the legislative level, the regulatory framework level, including the institutional level. Um, so this is a much bigger um, that we need to be done, but it's something that we need to do. 
um, if we are going to ensure that the ultimate outcomes that we are seeking to pursue in this um, project can be achieved. So let me just thank um, all of the participants who have remained with us and all those who decided on with us, but for one reason or another, we have to leave. Thank you for all of the questions and the comments that were in the chat and in the question and answer um, section. Those who raise their hands to speak, let me thank you also. Let me thank um, uh, those, um, Dr. Dinkins Jules, um, Ms. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, um, Dr. Sylvia Dalbert. Um, for, the, for the opening remarks at the beginning, that set the stage um, for, our, uh, for our meeting, for this kickoff. And all of the panelists, um, Tracy, Kyron, um, Annie, for your presentations, um, that gave us further details and information, the background, the context, the results of the study that was done, the challenges, the opportunities, um, as well as the details of the project itself, including the, the logical framework. Um, we hope that all of the participants will be able to get a better understanding of what we are seeking to do here in the OECS. We will be remaining in contact with you um, in terms of how we move forward and in the plan consultations and discussions that we want to have um, on the broader issues with regards to entrepreneurship. So, Unless if there are any other comments from my fellow panelists who may want to have anything, let me just thank you once again um, and wish all of you um, a good lunch. It's um, 12 19 and enjoy the rest of the day and we will be in touch. So, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon. I'm seeing a last minute raise hand from Dr. Eisenhower Douglas. Dr. Douglas. This is only the place on record my profound appreciation for the discussion today. You know, very positive. And um, we look forward to continuing to collaborate with your office on this particular initiative. I think the business community, the private sector, the entrepreneurs in the region, from the way it, is, it was discussed today, I think it, it, it holds great hope and promise as we implement going forward. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. I don't believe you had indicated who you were. Um, so if you can briefly do that. Well, yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> I am a former <laughs> director of trade in Dominica. Uh, I work for the government of Dominica. And I'm an economist by training. And I'm, I'm very much a patriot, not just of Dominica, but the OECS and CARICOM region. I, I want to see the, the region continue to develop, notwithstanding the various challenges and the, that come across, including COVID and the hurricanes and so on. You know? So we have to find a way to survive and triumph as a small, small group of countries, notwithstanding the challenges. And that is part of my effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. So colleagues, we have come to the end of this morning session. Um, so thank you. Between Compete Caribbean and the OECS, we will have a session this afternoon to flesh out some of the details of this project, um, including complementary. So have a good rest of the day and a good lunch. Um, and thank you. So we have come to an end. <laughs>